All right, I think we might get going at two or four now. We've got lots of us here. So welcome everybody um, to the legal exam revision session. Um, my name is Molly. I'll introduce myself and everyone properly, properly soon. But we are very excited to have you here today for our legal revision session. Um, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're gathered on today. I'm currently on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I would like to pay my respects to all elders past and present. So this, for some of you, might be your first Skyline revision session today for legal, which is super exciting. Some of you might have been to English or some of the other sessions this morning. Um, but we have lots more to go. So we wanted to let you know about some exciting sessions coming up for the rest of this week. So we've got economics, chemistry, sociology, further maths, EAL, literature, psychology, and specialist math. So if you're doing any of those subjects at all, we would highly recommend that you pop along to them. You can still register. It's free. There's lots of spots available um, to get some exciting tips and revision from some of our fantastic tutors, which is really exciting. Okay, so I'll start by introducing myself. So like I said, my name is Molly. I graduated VC in 2018 from PCW, Presentation College Windsor, which is now known as St. Mary's College. Um, I'm currently studying my honours year in Bachelor of Arts at Melbourne Uni, specialising in a thesis in English and Theatre Studies. But I've also studied, um, other than VC legal, also one semester of law at uni after high school. Um, I might pass over on to Rakea to introduce herself, and then we'll also hear from Dean and Sarah, our UBS volunteers from today. Perfect. Thanks, Molly. My name is Rakea. I'll be assisting Molly today with the presentation. So I graduated from Northern Bay College in 2019. I also graduated from the Skyline program then as well. I'm currently studying a Bachelor of Law and Commerce at Deakin University. I'm so excited to be here. I will hand over to Dean to introduce himself. Thanks, Rakaya. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Dean. Um, I work at UBS. I'm an investment banking analyst. I uh, started my career as a lawyer, so I was a solicitor for, for two years, um, having done a Bachelor of Law, Bachelor of Commerce degree, double degree at Monash University. Um, it's, it's great to be here and look forward to the session. I'll hand over to Sarah. Thanks, Dean. Um, my name's Sarah. I work at UBS in our management office, so working with our country head and chief operating officer here in Sydney. I studied a Bachelor of Commerce Liberal Studies at the University of Sydney, majoring in accounting and finance. Um, I joined UBS as an intern and then came back as a graduate, and I've um, worked here for almost 15 years. Um, so really excited to be part of the program today. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. And yeah, we're very grateful to have um, you guys here from UBS and we're very grateful for UBS's support. This session wouldn't be possible, made free to all your students without UBS. So thank you again. OK, just a few more things before we get properly started. So as you can tell, this is a Zoom webinar that we'll be using. So um, Rakea especially um, will be monitoring the chat, but instead of using the Zoom chat for content related questions or things like that, we're actually going to be using Mentimeter, which we'll go through soon, but the code um, and information will be down here on all of the slides. Um, and Rakea should put that in the chat hopefully as well. Um, but if there's any immediate questions for things like tech issues or other urgent things, let us know by the Zoom chat and the Zoom chat and we will help you. Um, if everything should run smoothly, but if there's any problems with Zoom, use the link, this link you were given to originally to try again. If for some reason the link does not work anymore, you will get updates via email, but don't worry about that. Everything should run smoothly today. So before we look at Mentimeter, little overview for how today's going to run. So for the first hour, we'll be doing content revision for Unit 3, so criminal and civil law. Then we'll take a quick little break. Um, after we come back from the break, we're going to do about two-thirds of the Unit 4 content, covering things like High Court, Parliament, Constitution. Um, then we'll have another little break, and then we'll finish off the day with the rest of the content, revise that, so we're going to cover all of the content today, but then also time for practice questions, exam tips, studying tips, and Q&A. And we'll also answer some questions as we go. So if you have any questions at all, 
you can pop them in Mentimeter, which I think we're going to look at now. So I'm just going to stop sharing for a moment and get up Mentimeter. Okay. So everyone. All right. So the code, if you need it again, is up here. And like I said, it'll be on all of the slides as well. So you can come back to it. I'll read it out as well. So the code is 65759000. Um, and we want to know to start off how you are feeling. Are you feeling excited, motivated, inspired, nervous, tired? That's totally fine as well. Exam revision can be a bit scary. Um, but pop in a word, let us know how you're feeling and hopefully we'll see some start to pop up. Tired, scared, confident, confidence good to see, intrigued, I like that. Tired and stressed, fair enough, term three holidays can be full on sometimes, hopefully you'll feel a bit more encouraged after today. Okay, so we've got a bit of a balance of some of you tired and scared and a lot of motivated and excited. So hopefully all of you will finish feeling motivated and excited, but yes, this is very exciting. So I'm just gonna pop on back over to the slides. So I'm gonna get that up, but that's great to see. Okay, I'm gonna get right into some content. All right, so I'm going to start with Unit 3 Area Study 1, so criminal justice system. So this is stuff all the way back from Term 1, maybe even end of last year. So hopefully this will be good to jog your memories a little bit um, and either revise some things or even learn some new things. And a reminder, one more time, if you have any questions at all to, to do with the content or just general studying or exam stuff, head over to Mentimeter and the code will be at the bottom of your screen. Otherwise, let's get into it. So principles of justice, first of all. So principles of justice are very important. They're sort of the foundation for all of Unit 3, um, fairness, equality, and access. So you need to be able to understand, first of all, what these principles are, what they actually mean, um, you know, when we say fairness, for example, but then also how to apply them um, to different bits of content. So, for example, how does having a jury uphold the principle of equality, things like that. So we'll talk about that as well. But let's go through them. So first of all, we have fairness. So fairness is a really interesting one because it means, um, and you've got to be careful when doing your definitions that you don't explain, fairness is the process of being fair. Because, okay, that's good, but you don't want to repeat the actual word, right? Or equality is being equal. So a good definition could be something like um, fairness involves impartial treatment, impartiality, so being unbiased and not discriminating against people, right? Um, so this will be really important for people like a judge in a trial, but for all people as well. So people need to have their case heard um, for, we'll talk about criminal law for now, but also for civil law, um, without fear of being treated unfairly, okay? So sometimes that means people need to be treated differently, in order to get a fair outcome. So, for example, um, if you are in a criminal case and English is not your um, first language, right, um, in order to achieve a fair outcome, you might need to be given an interpreter, okay? So that might be an extra resource that you're provided, but in order to achieve a fair outcome, that's the same for everybody. So being treated differently isn't always a bad thing, but it's to help ensure people have um, the ad adequate resources to have a fair trial. Whereas equality is about being treated the same, okay? So this means no one should be discriminated against based on any personal characteristics. So personal characteristics would include things like sexuality, gender, disability, race, class, age, anything like that. Um, so judges and juries and other people need to make sure they're not discriminating against people, either consciously or unconsciously. You know, sometimes people might have unconscious biases, but we need to make sure none of that is happening in a criminal trial. Um, so another example of this might be the right to a jury, trial by jury, um, because every person who commits an indictable offence, a serious offence, which we'll talk about soon, has the right to a trial by jury. And then we have access. So access involves two things. First of all, being able to make use of the legal system. So that means, okay, am I able to actually 
afford a lawyer who can actually help me make sense of the legal system? Um, can I, you know, do I have the time and effort to actually go into the into the courts in the city if I live rurally? So can you actually access and make use of the legal system? And then second of all, understanding your legal rights. So that might be things like Victoria Legal Aid, which we'll talk about soon, um, publishes a lot of information online for free and often in multiple languages as well. So that means that pe- people don't have to pay money to understand their legal rights, you know, especially if they can't afford a lawyer because lawyers can be very expensive. Um, but, yeah, so that's the overview of the principles of justice, but we'll probably keep touching on this as we go as well. Okay, next is key concepts. So... Um, A few different things you need to know for the basics of criminal law. So first of all, we've got summary offences. So um, summary offences are minor criminal offences and all of these will be heard in the magistrate's court. So there's lots of different types, but a minor summary offence would include something like driving offences. So if you were um, speeding or um, drink driving, maybe if it was, you know, not an extreme case, maybe minor theft, different things like that, that are still crimes, examples of crimes, and they need to be taken seriously. Um, But you're not likely to probably go to jail or anything like that. So they'll be heard in the magistrate's court. Um, And in the magistrate's court, if you've committed a summary offence, you will not get a trial by jury. Juries are only for the more serious indictable offences. So indictable offences, the opposite these they're the serious criminal offenses and they will be heard by a judge and a jury all indictable offenses will be granted a jury if they plead guilt not guilty to the crime so if if an accused person pleads guilty they won't have a trial and they go, they'll go straight to sentencing to get their punishment instead so these indictable offenses will be held in either the county or the Supreme Court because they're higher up in our court hierarchy. Um, So there's lots of examples of indictable offences, but might be things like homicide offences, so things like murder or manslaughter. They're obviously some of the most serious types of crimes, so they'll be heard in the Supreme Courts. But other things like drug-related offences, assault, different things like that. So they'll be heard in the more serious courts. Um, Okay, then we've got sort of a third category, which is called indictable offences heard or tried summarily. Um, So these are indictable offences that aren't the most serious of the indictable offences, right? So they're not things like murder or terrorism that, you know, will send you to jail for life, but they're almost on the border, right, that they're the less serious type of indictable indictable offences. So what can happen is you can, if you've committed one of these offences, you can apply to have that case heard in the magistrate's court as if it were a summary offence. So this would be a good option because the magistrate's court um, are more likely to give you probably a more lenient sentence. If if you were to go to prison, it wouldn't be for very long. it's more accessible, it's probably cheaper and a more straightforward trial because there's no jury involved. So it's less time consuming, it's less stressful, you'd probably save a bit of money and you'd get a smaller penalty. So probably all accused people would prefer to have their case heard in the magistrate's court compared to one or the other. So that's an option, but it's not automatically granted to every indictable offence. There's a special process you have to go through. You don't need to know about it, you don't need to know the process, but just know that it's not guaranteed for all cases. Okay, the next key concept is the burden of proof. So the burden of proof, which um, applies to criminal and civil, but in in general, um, is the responsibility of a certain party in the trial to prove the facts of the case. So that's the general definition. Um, In criminal cases specifically, the burden of proof um, lies with the prosecution. So the prosecution is the party that will bring the case forward, bring charges against an accused, And because they've brought the case forward, it's their responsibility to prove the facts of the case, so prove the guilt of the offender or at least find the truth about the case. Um, And specifically, if we talk about standard of proof, they have to satisfy the standard of proof to prove guilt. So what that means, um, the standard of proof is the strength of evidence required to prove someone's guilt in a criminal case. Um, So the prosecution has to prove not only is the accused guilty, but they're guilty be- what's called beyond a reasonable doubt. That's a really important term. So this means there's no doubt in the jury's mind or the magistrate's mind whatsoever that this person's committed a crime. So it can't be, you know, oh, like I'm 60% sure that they probably did this crime. You can't do that. It has to be beyond reasonable doubt, almost no doubt whatsoever. 
that the accused is guilty, just because, you know, the punishments for these crimes can be very serious and can change someone's life. So they need to be almost certain that this person's committed a crime. Um, then we also have presumption of innocence. So presumption of innocence just means every person, no matter what crime they've committed, no matter how small or serious it is, um, has to be treated as innocent until proven guilty. So a good example of presumption of innocence is bail. So magistrates will try to grant bail to people because we want to assume that they're innocent, right? Doesn't matter if, you know, how serious the crime is or how many prior convictions they have, even though those might be taken into consideration, you can't automatically assume that someone is guilty. Okay. Um, but yes, race in recent years, bail's become a little bit more controversial because um, there have been some crimes that have happened. A good, an example would be the Burke Street incident a few years ago, I think started 2018 or 17, um, when the offender committed a very serious offence while on bail, which just means that they're out in society and they're not being held in jail. Um, so they need to be careful that really dangerous criminals aren't being granted bail to like keep the community safe but otherwise they have to at the first point treat people as innocent they can't assume that they're guilty okay moving on so next we have the rights of an accused so um the first there's three rights of the accused um that you need to know so the first right is the right to be tried without unreasonable delay so this right comes from the human rights charter i think the full name is the Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities Act, um, but you can just call it the Human Rights Charter, that is fine. Um, and it means that all accused people are entitled to have their trial heard without being interrupted by unreasonable delays. Keyword here is unreasonable. Um, so any, you know, an example might be if the prosecution um, has to delay the trial by two months because they forgot that they had to submit this piece of evidence by this date. That's not really fair on the accused. All the parties need to be prepared um, so they can have their charge heard in a timely manner. Because if the trial keeps getting dragged out, it's costing them more time, which is stressful and even traumatic sometimes, um, and also expensive. If they have a lawyer, they're going to have to pay for their lawyer for an extended period of time. Um, but yeah, key word is unreasonable. So for example, in 2020, when we moved on into lockdowns and the courts had to transition online, there probably would have been delays with that as they figured out this system, but that would be expected. So that would be okay as a delay. Um, but yes, everyone that commits a crime is guaranteed this right, no matter if it's summary or indictable. Second right, that you need to know, right to a fair hearing. So this has two components. The first is that an accused person will have their case heard by a competent, independent and impartial court. So this just means competent, the judge is qualified and has expertise in this area, they're independent and they're impartial. So they're not going to treat you with any bias, they will treat you fairly and with equality as well. Um, and yeah, won't discriminate against you in any way, won't assume that you're guilty, anything like that. And then the second part to write to a fair hearing is that the hearing has to be fair um, and public as well. So um, most court cases, criminal court cases, will be open to the public, um, meaning anyone can walk in there if you wanted to. Tomorrow you could go down to the magistrate's court and just watch some cases. Um, there's obviously some exceptions to that, though, for more sensitive cases, which would include things like um, domestic violence cases or um, sexual offences as well, which isn't, they close those cases in order to protect the rights of the um, the victim. So they're not feeling like there's too much pressure on them or they're feeling embarrassed in public or anything like that. So those will be closed off, but otherwise the case will be open to the public to keep everything transparent. Third right is the right to trial by jury. Um, so right to trial by jury um, means every person that commits an indictable offence is guaranteed a trial by jury, meaning their peers from the community will decide the verdict, so whether or not the accused is guilty. So this right originally comes from Section 80 of the Constitution. So the Constitution says anybody that commits a Commonwealth indictable offence gets a trial by jury, but that only covers Commonwealth offences specifically, um, whereas most crimes are not Commonwealth offences um, because the Crimes Act, which outlines types of crimes, comes from Victorian legislation. So what that means is that people who commit all other types of crimes don't get a jury. 
that's not so good. So what happens is there's other Victorian legislation which covers that. So that says if you commit an indictable offence in Victoria, you'll be guaranteed the right to a jury. So all people who commit indictable offences, specifically indictable, will get um, trial by jury. Okay, on to rights of victims. So um, again, three rights for rights of victims that you need to know. So first one, right to give evidence as a vulnerable witness. Um, so this is to ensure that victims are protected during the case because often criminal cases will be quite serious. Um, victims might um, be suffering a lot of trauma from the crime that they've been a victim of. Um, so they need to be protected. But sometimes they also need to give evidence, okay, so to um, be a witness and give information about what happened in the, during the crime. So in order to make sure, first of all, the victim feels safe in a courtroom, but also that the evidence they give is reliable because if a victim is giving evidence as a witness but they're really emotionally in some sort of distress, there's no guarantee that the evidence they're giving is reliable. So it needs to make sure it's credible credible evidence. So they do these things to make sure that's the case. So things like um, as they give evidence, they might be guaranteed a support person. Um, they might take out the accused, the offender, out of the courtroom so they don't have to see them there. They might give evidence um, via like a video link, um, something like via Zoom. Um, and there's a few other things as well that like maybe having a closed courtroom. So yeah, it's to protect the witness but make sure the evidence is reliable as well. Next one, um, right to be informed about proceedings. So um, this right comes under the Victim's Right Charter and it recognises that um, victims need to be updated about criminal proceedings and what's happening. Um, so they'll get information from the prosecution, from the justice system about things such as um, any dates of hearings or trials that are happening, um, if they don't actually attend the trial, they're under no obligation to. They'll get an um, update about the outcome of a trial, if they're found guilty or not guilty, and of the sentence that the accused gets if they're found guilty. So, yes, they will be updated about this information. And then the third right, which is quite similar, is the right to be informed about the likely release date of the accused. So um, this means that not only will they get general information, but it's a right that they have to be told the release date of their, their um, the offender from prison if they've been in prison. So this has to be given by the prosecution within two weeks of the um, offender being released from prison just to make sure the victim isn't um, shocked and sort of taken aback by this news. They have time to prepare so they can feel safe in their life. Um, okay, next is role of institutions. So. Um, two institutions that you need to know. First one is Victoria Legal Aid. So VLA, you can call it in your answers. You can shorten actually any words in the legal exam as long as you put it in brackets first. So if you were to shorten VLA, you'd write Victoria Legal Aid, brackets VLA, and then say VLA from there on onwards. So I'll say VLA for now. So they're a government agency that gives free legal advice to the community um, and they can also give legal representation, so be, the, be their lawyer in the courtroom, either for free, um, it's called pro bono, or for a very low cost instead. Um, so this is for people who can't afford a lawyer. So they'll do a test to um, see if someone financially qualifies for legal representation. Um, there's not very much funding that they get from the government. Um, recently, the Victorian government's given them extra funding, but it's still not enough to cover all people who need representation. So sometimes, unfortunately, there'll be people who sort of fit in the middle financial bracket that they're they're not qualified for financial aid um but they also can't afford a lawyer so they'll be forced to be um self-represented which is unfortunate and will reduce access and things like that but VLA does what it can then you know even if you don't qualify for a lawyer you can always get information online as well it's actually a good thing to do to while you're studying play around with the VLA website there's lots of information there and you can see the sort of things they offer for people um, the second type, community legal centres, so CLCs. Um, so these are a little bit different to VLAs. They also offer legal advice and information. Um, there's two different types, though. So they, we've got generalist CLCs, which um, provide all different types of help, um, and they're based on just, like, geographical areas. So, for example, Fitzroy Legal Service. But then we have specialist CLCs, which have 
a particular focus in an area of law. Um, so, for example, there's a youth law centre. Um, there's one that specialises in refugee law as well. So they have targeted advice for specific like, demographics or different areas of law. Um, okay, I think we'll keep going. So committal proceedings is next. So committal, yeah, you need to know about committal proceedings, but especially the committal hearing. So the committal hearing is what happens before um, the, an indictable offence's trial, and it will happen in the magistrate's court. So even though indictable offences are heard in the county and supreme courts, those higher up courts, they'll have this early hearing, the committal hearing, in the magistrate's court. Um, so this is where the accused will be able to decide their plea, if they're going to plead guilty or not guilty. Um, but they get to make that decision based on information presented in the hearing. So they'll get to see um, the witnesses that the prosecution has, any evidence that they have. So, you know, when you're watching like a movie sometimes and they'll have this big criminal trial and then all of a sudden they'll like whip out this like surprise evidence and then everyone's like, oh, my gosh, that doesn't actually happen <laughs> in Victorian criminal trials. What will happen instead is you see all of the evidence at the very start in the committal proceeding. So if you're thinking, okay, I might plead not guilty, I think I've got a good chance in my trial, but then you see the prosecution you know, has CCTV footage of you committing this crime. You might think, oh, they've got a really strong case. They've got lots of witnesses. I probably don't have much of a chance. I'm going to plead guilty and then I might get a reduced sentence. So it's a really good way to achieve like fairness in the criminal justice system because it's very transparent. You can see all the evidence and it's a chance for you to make your plea as well. That's an informed decision. Um, some strengths and weaknesses there, but I think we've covered most of that. Um, okay, next is plea negotiations. So plea negotiations is a process that also happens before um, the trial, um, but this is a discussion between the two parties, so the prosecution and the accused, um, and the prosecution will say something like, if you are um, willing to plead guilty, we will reduce the charge from three counts of assault to two, right, which would, would which would result in a reduced sentence. Um, so sort of everyone involved would want to skip the trial process because it means the accused um, saves time and money. Um, they'll probably get a reduced sentence as well, saves the time and effort of the prosecution and the court as well. Um, but obviously it's up to the accused. They're not forced into this. It's just a, something that they're offered and it's up for them to decide if they want to take it. And this is for both summary and indictable offences as well. Next is sentence indications. So sentence indications um, happen between the accused and the judge. And it, if I'm the accused, I go up to the judge and I say, um, if I were to plead guilty, what sentence would you give me? And I'll tell them if they probably will go to prison and what, what the likely sentence would be. So this is a good option because it, again, helps me make an informed decision about if I want to plead guilty or not. Um, but there's no obligation for me to follow through. So you could see how maybe it feels a bit suspicious if I said, if I plead guilty, what would happen? But the, the court can't take that as an admission of guilt. They have to just, that's my right, that I can ask for sentence indication if I want to. Um, and they can't assume that I'm guilty because I've asked for it, even if I say no afterwards. Um, and also, if I say yes, I will plead guilty, the courts can't change their mind about the sentence they give me. So they can't say, okay, we'll send you to prison for 18 months, but then they actually do three years. That would be really unfair. They have to sort of stick to their word instead. Okay. Um, so, yeah, purpose of sentence indications. Um for the accused to sort of make help them make a more informed decision. Um, and, yeah, again, it helps everyone to sort of skip the trial, save time and money and effort, and also for the victims as well because trials can be very stressful for them. Okay, next is reasons for a court hierarchy. So this is a little photo of the court hierarchy over here. Um, we've already been talking about it a little bit, but we've got magistrate's court, then county court, supreme court, and then the High Court, which is a federal court. So that's actually in Canberra, but it sits at the top of every court hierarchy in Australia. Um, and then the Supreme Court has two divisions. So the trial division, where cases will be heard for the first time, and then the Court of Appeal, which only hears appeals. So you need to know, first of all, 
what the court hierarchy is, like what the order is. You'll never be asked in an exam um, what, um, it, it won't say list the court hierarchy or anything like that, but you might need to know it for things like where would this case be appealed to or things like that. So it's really, really handy um, to actually know the court hierarchy, but specifically you need to know the reasons why we have it. Um, so the first reason for criminal law is appeals. So if I have my case heard in magistrate's court um, and I'm really unhappy with the outcome based on a point of law, I think something's gone wrong um, in the magistrate's like decision-making process, I can appeal that case if I have um, a basis for it. So having these three courts, or sort of four courts above me, gives me room to appeal upwards. And you can keep appealing upwards sort of until you reach the top of it. So that's a really good way to achieve fairness that if something goes wrong, I can correct that. Um, so that's appeals, but then also specialization. So um, specialization means these different courts can become, and the judges in them or magistrates can become experts in their field. So, for example, Supreme Court is the only court that hears homicide cases. So they'll become really knowledgeable in those types of cases. The magistrates court are experts in like summary offences, bail applications, and things like that. Um, so it just means when you're having your case heard, the judges sort of the best of the best, and they'll know exactly what they're doing because they've heard these cases many times before. Okay, then we've got key personnel. So you need to know the role of the judge, which we've talked a little bit about already. Um, the judge is there to act as a really sort of impartial decision maker, almost like an umpire, that they um, aren't allowed to do any external sort of research that gives them bias, obviously legal research that they can do, but, you know, they can't be, you know, reading Facebook articles about the trial or reading up on this celebrity who's one of the parties, nothing like that. They have to say I'm biased, um, not discriminate against either of the parties. Um, their, their job is also to direct the jury, um, tell the jury what they have to do, tell them to listen to evidence. The jury will make the verdict, so the jury will decide if they're guilty or not guilty, but then the judge will give a sentence. Um, so whether it's a fine or imprisonment or a community corrections order or something else. So that is the judge. Yes, the jury. So there's 12 jurors in a um, criminal trial, um, just chosen randomly from the electoral roll. So anyone who's enrolled to vote, so you have to be over 18 um, and an Australian citizen, but anyone can be chosen as a juror, um, which is good because it sort of is a representation of the community. They're unbiased, they're listening to evidence. Um, they give a sort of fair, unbiased decision the verdict. Um, then we've also got parties. So the two parties in a criminal case, as we've said, the prosecution and the accused. Um, sometimes parties will not have lawyers with them, legal representation. So they might have to represent themselves and present their own evidence and talk to the jury. Um, sometimes legal practitioners, so lawyers can help with that as well, if they can either afford one or if one is granted to them by something like Victoria Legal Aid. Um, so lawyers have a really helpful role to try to sort of present the case in the best possible light, um, but they have to be careful because they have a duty to their client, of course, but they also have a duty to the court, which is more important. So they're not allowed to lie to the court or deceive the court or mislead them in any way. So they have to um, sort of respect and not mislead either the courts or their own client as well. Um, okay, getting close to the end of criminal law, which is good. So next is sanctions. So there's five purposes of sanctions, which are punishment, protection, denunciation, deterrence, and rehabilitation. Um, there's, it's not really an acronym to learn them, but I always learned these because there's a lot of repetition in the letters, P-P-D-D-R. That's something I memorized, sort of helped me. Not sure if it will help you, but little tricks like that can be super helpful. Um, so I'll quickly go through them. So Sorry. I'm just going oh, to sorry. That's okay. I do notice uh, someone has their hands up. Oh, Is I didn't see that. That's okay. Um, who has got their hand up? I think it was Isabella, but I think it's lowered now. Oh, uh, okay. Um, that's all right. all right. No, no, thanks for throwing my attention to that. Was it Isabella, did you say? Yep, all good. I'll message you. Oh, <laughs> she said that was a mistake. No, that's so good. Um, glad we checked. So, but yeah, if you guys... Remind if you've got any questions at all, uh, let us know if there's urgent things, pop them in the chat. But 
Um, if you have questions, pop them into Menti and we will help. Thanks, Rekha, that's good to check. Um, okay, so yeah, punishment. So punishment, um, the aim of punishment is to, you could say punish, but I'm not going to say penalize maybe the offender um, for the like, criminal wrongdoing they have done. So if they have committed murder, that is wrong and they're going to be sent probably to jail to suffer a punishment um, to tell them what they did was wrong. Then we have protection, so to protect the community specifically. So I'm just going to keep using the example of murder, but obviously there's lots of different types of criminal cases. Um, but the point of protection is to protect the community. So if someone commits murder and they're sent to jail, um, that, that person has had their freedom taken away from them. They're placed outside of society. They're locked away, which, yeah, aims to keep the community safe. Um, then denunciation. So denunciation is about... Um, sort of morally condemning these crimes. So the judge will say, I'm sending you to prison because society doesn't accept murder. That's not part of it. our values. What you did was wrong. And we want you to know that we don't tolerate that behaviour in our society. Then we have deterrence. So deterrence is about um, preventing further offending of both um, the, um, the, the general community, but the specific offender as well. So there's two types. There's general deterrence, which is everyone, and then specific deterrence is preventing the specific offender from committing that crime again. And then we have rehabilitation, which is aiming to reform an offender. So if they're sent to um, prison for a crime like murder, um, they'll be given programs like um, drug and alcohol programs if they suffer from addiction or substance abuse. Um, but other things as well, like education courses. So they might be able to get a diploma while they're in prison, which would help them re-enter society, get a job and become, yeah, a productive member of society. Um, okay, but the actual sanctions. We've got fines, first of all. So when thinking about if fines achieve purposes of sanctions, it often depends on the wealth of the offender. So if you got a $250 fine for speeding, um, the success of this fine, as in does it stop reoffending, completely depends on, first of all, um, yeah, the, the wealth of the offender, right? So if they're this millionaire that just goes around speeding all the time, they can probably throw away $250, not going to affect them too much, right? They might just keep speeding and keep committing that offence. Um, if it's someone that's really struggling financially, uh, maybe like a uni student living out of home, for example, a $250 fine would probably be effective in getting them to stop speeding, right? So that's a really important thing to think about. Um, then community corrections orders. So these are sentences served not in prison but in the community, although they can, um, you can get this and imprisonment at the same time, but also they can be given by themselves. So they have to um, go through sort of unpaid community work is one of their conditions. Um, like you see in this photo, something like collecting rubbish, but it's not always that. Um, and there'll be other conditions as well, things like they have to stay within Victoria. If they move address, they have to tell, um, they have to report that. Um, they're not allowed to commit a crime. If you committed a crime while you're on a CCO, you probably get a more severe punishment next time. Um, so things like that. And then imprisonment, which we've been talking about a lot already. So this is sort of a last resort type of sanction, meaning the court, in theory, should try every other option other than imprisonment before they give this as a sentence because you're literally taking someone's freedom away and putting them in society, right? So they don't want to send people to prison. Sometimes it's the only option that they have, though. Okay, then you need to know about factors in sentencing. So um, aggravating factors and mitigating factors. So aggravating factors are things that... Um, increase the seriousness of the offence and make them look worse. So something like if I um, robbed a store but I was very violent when I did it, that would make the crime more serious. Whereas mitigating factors make things a bit better and reduce the seriousness. So um, I was charged for assaulting someone at a party because I punched someone, um, but maybe I was provoked by the victim and they used maybe offensive langu a language or a slur or something, right? It doesn't excuse the behaviour, but it explains how it happened. So that will reduce the seriousness and reduce the severity of the sanction that they're given. Um, and then two other things, guilty pleas and victim impact statements. So your guilty pleas will, um, if you plead guilty very early on, 
into the case, that'll probably make you look better because it shows that you, you're you showing remorse. Um, and then victim impact statements will be offered to victims. Do they want to speak in the courtroom or give a written submission, which will sort of just explain the suffering that they've endured as a result of the crime. Um, so this will, the courts will read it and they don't have to listen to the victim. So if the victim says, I want this person to be locked away in jail for the rest of their life, doesn't mean they automatically will be, but the courts will have to consider how serious that impact was in the lives of the victims. And then last thing for criminal is reform. So um, three factors you need to know about, so cost, time, and culture. So these are things like um, are the principles of justice principles of justice achieved based on costs, right? Lawyers are very expensive. Maybe that reduces access. However, legal aid can help. Um, and then time, you've got things like there are a lot of delays in preparing a case for a trial. Um, things might be pushed back. But things like plea negotiations, which might skip a trial, that can help with time and reduce that stress. And then cultural factors. So things like different people from different cultures have different customs about answering questions and how to behave in the courtroom. So, for example, there are some cultures where it's seen rude to say no. Um, so if that was the case, someone being um, e examined as a witness might say no to things that they don't actually mean no to, right? So you need to figure out how to work around that. Um, you can also think about experience of Indigenous people. In the courtroom, so Indigenous people are really overrepresented in prison. Um, they're only 2% of our population, but I can't remember the exact number, but the way more people in prison than there should be, right? If there's 2% in population, there should be only 2% of prison. It should be Indigenous, but it's much more than that, which is sort of a fault of the justice system. Um, but things like the Curry Court can try to help, which are targeted Um at Indigenous people, um, which help to, they, they can speak with elders and try to understand the consequences of their actions and the cultural significance of it as well. So those are three factors you need to know. I haven't put in specific reforms to learn because it will depend on you and your class and what you're interested in, but you do need to know one recent reform and one recommended reform for each of these factors. And it has to be from the last four years. It has to be recent. So um, between 2018 and 2022. That's the time frame you have. Okay, that is it for criminal law. So I think um, we have time for probably maybe like two questions um, before we do a bit more civil stuff and then we'll head over to a break very soon. So um, I'm just going to open up Menti again. Okay, so where is it? Okay, cool. We've got some questions in here. And yeah, you can upvote questions as well. So if you see a question that you also want answered, you can um, do a little thumbs up, I think, and it will come to the front, which is really cool. Um, okay, so does the support person that the witness gets have to be an individual that is unrelated to the case? Um, that's a really good question. I don't know if there's an official rule about that procedure. Um, I don't think so. I think typically it will be a family member or maybe like a spouse. Um, but I would assume that if the support per the support person probably couldn't be um, criminally involved in it, right, if it was like a co-accused or something like that. Um, but I don't think there's any official rule. I might look that up in the break. Um, good question. I think for now, though, no. Um but either way, I don't think you would need to know that for your answers. But that's a really good question, though. Um, unless, Rakea, you don't happen to know any extra information about that, do you? I just want to add something on. So the witness can really choose their support person. They can mm -hmm. be, for example, their parent, their guardian, relative, friend or professional counsellor or someone else. And in some cases where the witness is very vulnerable, they can choose more than one support person, like, for example, a parent or a counsellor. But usually they wouldn't be able to choose a accused, for example. Yeah, awesome, thank you. All right, I think one more and then we'll keep going. So if an individual commits both a summary and indictable offence at the same time, are they heard together or separately? Since the offences are usually heard in different courts. That's a good question. Um, I'm actually not sure. Rakeh, do you know the answer to this? 
I haven't seen cases like this. Yeah, I think the consensus is they will be heard through the indictable offence and they sentence can be concurrent so they can serve both of the sentences together. Usually if it's an indictable and summary offence, the more serious case will be heard. Yeah, awesome. Okay, great. I'm going to put that as answered and then keep going on it because we've got a bit of civil content to get through too, but I promise we will come back to questions soon. Okay, so let's do about 10 more minutes of civil content and then we will have a break. So, um, okay, now we've got to yeah, switch our mindsets over to civil law. Um, a lot of it does overlap though. So the parties in civil law are now the plaintiff and the defendant. So no prosecution or police involved, they're not criminal charges. The plaintiff is the person who um, it begins the civil case, right? So I'll use the example of Rakea and I. If I wanted to sue Rakea for something, I would be the plaintiff who initiates the case and she would be the defendant who allegedly has um, committed a wrongdoing. So it's a wrongdoing is not a crime but something negligent or they've breached a duty of care or something like that. Um, so if I'm the, I'm the plaintiff, so I've started the case, so I would have the burden of proof to fact um, to prove the facts of the case. Um, so I would have to fulfil the standard of proof, um, which is um, balance of probabilities. So balance of probabilities is much lower than in a um, criminal trial. Um, it's not you have to be 100% sure. It's almost 50-50, right? So who is more likely to be in the right um, and the other person would be in the wrong? Um, so, and, and juries are also optional in civil trials. So that'll be up to the jury if there is one. Otherwise, the judge, it'll be up for the judge to decide. Um, then we have what's called representative proceedings. So representative proceedings um, are also known as class actions. You might have heard of that before. This is when a group of seven or more plaintiffs join together if they have a similar case and a similar claim they want to take against the same um, defendant. Um, so it's a really good option because group members, the plaintiffs will share the costs. Sometimes there might also be what's called a litigation funder who will fund the class action on their behalf. Um, and in return, they'll get a percentage of the damages if the case is successful. Um, so it's also less stressful, less intimidating if you have, you know, seven people together and you're not the only one there. Um, then You've, we've got to think about things to consider before you initiate a civil case. So things to consider would be um, negotiations, first of all. So if before I go and take Rakea to the county court, right, I would think, have I actually had an informal negotiation with her? So have we talked? Have we tried to resolve the matter between, between ourselves? Um, because if we can resolve by ourselves outside the court, it saves a lot of time and money. And we don't have to get lawyers involved or anything like that. Then costs. So if I want to initiate a civil claim, can I actually afford to do that? So can I afford a lawyer? Um, can I afford to take time off work if I needed to? Um, if I, because um, a lot of people would think, okay, it's okay. If I win the case, I'll make that money back. But that's not guaranteed. So are you prepared if you lose the case as well? Um, so costs are really important to think about. Then also the limitation of actions. So the limitation of actions um, is something you have to think about. Has it been too long, right? Has my time limit already passed for initiating this case? Because some do, might be a year, might be two years, might be more. Um, some cases that are a bit more sensitive don't have any limitation on them, um, but a lot of them do. So that's important to check just to make sure the evidence is recent and reliable and things like that. And then scope of liability. So you could think about if it's in a workplace, um, you've got to think about who's responsible. So if you, let's say you went to McDonald's and you got food poisoning from there, right? You Your first thought might be, okay, I'm going to sue the person that cooked my burger. Um, but that's not quite right. You don't sue the 15-year-old, right, that made your burger, but their employer would be responsible for them. So that's called vicarious liability, and that's a good principle to talk about. Um, and then enforcement issues. So, okay, let's say I'm suing for a million dollars. I win my case. Can the defendant actually pay that? Um, like maybe are they bankrupt or they don't have enough money? Um, are they overseas? Are they in jail? Are they a missing person? I don't know where they are, right? So things like that that are important to think about. 
Um, okay, then Consumer Affairs Victoria. So um, I'll call them CAV for now, just to shorten that. So they're a um, body that de- can deal with dispute resolution processes. Um, so you can have your case settled through here instead of in the courtroom. Um, but other than that, they also inform people about consumer laws. They give advice to the government about consumer affairs, things like that. So they use conciliation as their dispute resolution method, which we will get to soon. Um, so CAV is a really good option if you want to stay out of the courtrooms, but it's a very sort of specific um, jurisdiction that they have. So it has to be consumer affair, meaning something to do with buying a product and For example, you bought a car and it's faulty and they're not giving you a refund on it. You could go to consumer affairs. That would be relevant. But if it was a discrimination lawsuit or something, probably not the best place to go. Okay, and then VCAT. So VCAT um, is a dispute resolution body um, like CAV. It's outside of the courtroom. They've got a much wider jurisdiction though. Um, So they also trying to give... Um, a cheap, accessible option. It's not free to go to VCAT. It is free for the most part to go to CAV, um, but it's much cheaper than the courtrooms. They don't require you to have a lawyer either, so that will save you a lot of money. And they also have a three-tier fee system. So it goes, I think, business or like corporate and then regular and then people with um, healthcare cards, so like pensioners, um, maybe students on like youth allowance support, people like that that need a bit of financial support, they will get a discount on their fees, which is a really good um, way to help people with costs. Um, So, yeah, with VCAT, they'll also not just use conciliation, but they'll also have mediation um, and then sort of like a final hearing that's not quite like the courtroom. It's probably most similar to arbitration, but... If you haven't heard of these words before, don't worry, we'll talk about them soon. They're coming up in the content. But VCAT's probably, in general, a more reliable option than CAV just because they have a wider jurisdiction um, that covers a lot of different things. Um, But sometimes they have delays, sometimes things go wrong, sometimes um, you might need to... Another good thing is you can appeal your case if you're not happy with the outcome as well. So um, if you get it, you'll get a binding decision from VCAT, a VCAT member, um, but if you're not happy with that, you can appeal it, which is good, a good thing. Okay, um, next is pretrial procedures. So um, pleadings is the first thing you want to learn about. Um, so these are documents exchanged between the plaintiff and the defendant um, about the nature of the claim and how it's going to run. So um, I, the plaintiff, would send Rakea what's called a statement of claim, which says, basically, I'm suing you. This is why this is what happened. This is why it was wrong. Um, and this is the remedy that I'm seeking. So I'm seeking $10,000 compensation. Um, Rakea, the defendant, would then send me back a statement of defence, um, which would, um, you would sort of defend yourself and say, yes, okay, I'll see you in court. Or you might say, let's actually have a mediation, try to settle this ourselves. Um, if she wanted to, Rakea could also um, file a counterclaim, which she says, no, you're in the wrong. I'm going to take a civil action against you instead. That doesn't always happen, though. That's optional. Um, Then discovery of documents. So discovery is about exchanging evidence that's being prepared. So um, this means sort of like the committal hearing. Everything needs to be really transparent. So um, all parties can see each other's evidence. So I can see, okay, the defendant has um, a medical expert. I want one of them to. I'm going to go prepare that for my witnesses, right? Um, So you can exchange the different types of evidence, everything's transparent, everything is really fair. Um, And then exchange of evidence as well, which is similar to discovery, but this is specifically about types of witnesses. So like the list of witnesses you'll have in a trial. Um, So there's two types of witnesses. You've got, first of all, expert evidence and then lay evidence. Expert evidence would be like a medical expert, a lawyer, um, a professor at this university who are experts in their fields. And then lay evidence are just everyday people who are sharing what they know about a case. Um, so they might have seen something happen. It might be like a co-worker of a person or different, different things like that. Um, so the purpose is, yeah, to try to um, reduce the element of surprise um, so you know what to expect in the courtroom. Like I said, it's not like those movie 
courtroom dramas where um, you've got that big surprise that doesn't happen. Reduces element of surprise. Um, you can determine the strength of each other's cases. So I might go, oh, I'm not really confident in my case. Maybe let's actually step back, have a mediation, try to settle this ourselves. Um, then I think we've got time for one more bit of content before we have a break. So next up is a, um, the court hierarchy. So we've already talked about appeals, having the court hierarchy allows for appeal so that you talk about that in criminal and civil law. Um, but for civil law, we also talk about administrative convenience. So this means the cases are distributed in the court hierarchy based on how serious and complex they are. So if I'm suing someone for a million dollars, um, they would say, okay, well, that's too complex for the magistrate's court, um, so maybe we'll send you to the Supreme Court instead. Um, the magistrate's court can hear between 10,000 to 100,000. Anything less will be sent outside of the courtroom. Anything more than that will go to the county or Supreme Courts. But it's good that we have a court hierarchy so they'll develop, you know, specific areas of how much remedy you are seeking um, and where the most appropriate place to be, what which one it would be. Okay, we're not quite through the civil content yet, but that is okay. We're actually going to have a quick 15-minute break. So I'm going to skip ahead to our break slide. I'm going to come back to questions later. But if you have questions during the break, pop them in and we'll come back to them very soon. Um, but for now, we're going to have 15-minute break. So have a stretch, get some water, um, whatever you need to do. Um, but before we head off, I am going to play this video from Sarah, um, our UBS volunteer who's here today. So I will play this and we will see you back here at 3.15. Hi everyone, it's great to be with you today and to be part of the Skyline program. My name is Sarah Miller, I'm from UBS. My current role is working in our management office, so working closely with the two country heads for Australia and New Zealand, along with the Chief Operating Officer and the Chief Risk Officer. I have been with UBS for almost 15 years. I first joined UBS as an intern and returned as a graduate once I completed my university studies. My graduate role was in an area of the business called market risk, and that involved working closely with the equity traders to understand their risk exposures and to make sure that the trading books were kept within um, agreed risk limits. So I did that role for three years and then I moved internally with UBS into my current role in the management office. I really enjoy working at UBS. There's a great culture here. The people I work with are amazing. I really enjoy coming to work every day. It's very difficult to pick one career highlight. Um, I would have to say though that I think UBS offers incredible uh, career development opportunities and I've really um, been very lucky to be part of a number of training programs with UBS uh, both in Australia and in the US and the UK and Hong Kong um, and not only is that great technical knowledge that you gain at those um, courses but also getting to meet colleagues um, in different locations. visit skyline.org.au to view our full 2022 exam revision schedule. We'll just wait one more minute, give a chance for everyone to come back and then we will keep going.
All right, 3.15 now, so I think we will keep going. Hope everyone had a nice break, time to recharge, but let's keep going through the rest of our civil content and then some Unit 4 stuff. So we're back again, key personnel, so that comes up again in civil and criminal law. Um, so I won't go over this too much because we've covered most of it. The main difference is, I guess, the role of the jury. Um, like I said before, juries are optional in civil trials. They're not guaranteed to everyone like they are in criminal trials, um, which means it's up to the parties if they want to invest in having a jury. Um, so if there is a jury, they will decide, um, and there's also only six of them, so it's a much smaller jury in a civil trial. Um, but if they are there, they have the same role to listen to directions, be objective, unbiased, and then they'll decide on not the guilt. We don't call it the guilt in civil trial, but what's called the liability. So whether or not the defendant is in the wrong. Um, and then it will be up to the judge um, to decide the remedy. So we'll talk about remedies in a minute, but whether someone will get financial compensation or something else. So that's what happens when there is a jury. If there's no jury, in a civil case, the judge will do both of those things. So decide on the liability and the remedy as well. Then we've got the parties and legal practitioners again. Um, I won't go this too much, pretty much the same. Um, an extra thing though to learn for civil law in this area of study is um, the overarching obligations is a good thing um, to learn. So there are 10 overarching obligations. If you want to have a look at the full list, they'll be online. They're in the Civil Procedures Act. Um, you don't need to memorise all 10 of them. It's just good to know that they exist. Um, it just means things like we said before that um, lawyers can't mislead the courts because they have a duty to them. They need to be um, transparent, things like that. But they, they should be online if you want to have a look at them. But again, no need to memorise them. Um, next is case management powers. So there's two types of case management powers um, you need to learn. First of all, how to order mediation and then power to give directions. I might actually start with power to give directions. So this just means the judge during a trial has the power to direct um, the plaintiff and the defendant to do certain things. So um, an example of this might be you have to submit this bit of evidence by this date to sort of give timelines of thing, when things need to happen. And this can happen before the trial or during the trial as well. Um, and then you can say an, exa uh, an example of power to give directions, which you need to know, is power to order mediation. So if the judge thinks this case doesn't need to be heard within the courts and everyone can save a bit of time and money, um, they can actually direct this case to mediation outside of the courtroom, um, which will be settled privately. Everyone saves a bit of time and money, which is a good option for everyone, but we'll cover mediation again soon. Oh, here we go. Right now <laughs> we'll cover mediation. So um, you need to know the different types of dispute resolution methods. So first one we'll talk about is mediation. So um, mediation is an alternative dispute resolution method, meaning it'll be settled outside of the courtroom. But like we just said, the courts can organise it if they think it's appropriate. Um, so the two parties, the plaintiff and the defendant, will have a discussion with an independent and unbiased third party who's called the mediator, um, who will... Yeah, or the, the main role of the mediator really is to facilitate discussion. So to make sure there's no power imbalances, everyone's having their voice heard. Um, the mediator has to stay neutral, meaning they can't actually offer suggestions. So they can't say, how about you pay this much money or you sign this contract or whatever. The mediator has to really stay neutral and their only job really is to facilitate, facilitate discussion, make sure things are running smoothly. So it's a good option to save time and money. Um, one downside to mediation is that it's um, non-binding. Um, so there's no obligation for the parties to follow through with their side of the deal. If you do want it to be binding, you can go to the courts to try to seek um, something that will make it binding, but um, that's sort of an extra step, just sort of on its own mediation is not a binding process. Um, then we have conciliation, which... Majority of it is the same process. The only differences are instead of the mediator, we have the conciliator. And the, concili the conciliator will also facilitate discussion, but they can actually offer suggestions for how to resolve this case. Um, so they might say, okay, it seems that this would be a fair option. Maybe you just pay this much money by this date. And then, the, and then it's up to the parties to decide if they want to do that or not. So the parties still maintain control over the case. Um, but it's nice to have a conciliator give suggestions to sort of get them going in the right direction. 
Then the third one you need to know is arbitration. So um, arbitration um, means it's, it's a bit more formal. It's still outside of the courtroom. Um, but the third party, the arbitrator, um, will act again as like an unbiased independent party, um, but they will make a final binding decision. So the parties don't make a decision, but the arbitrator actually does. Um, so this is for people who want a more reliable binding outcome, um, might be willing to put a bit more time and effort into it because you might have lawyers involved in this, so it might cost a bit of money. Um, but still, even if you're paying money for a lawyer, it'd be much cheaper than being in the courtroom because it's a lot quicker, a lot more efficient. Um, okay, next, uh, remedies. So um, remedies are the sort of umbrella term for different types of compensation a plaintiff can receive if the defendant is found liable, um, so if their case is successful. So the first type and the type you've probably heard of before are damages. So it's two types of damages. They're both um, an amount of money that will be paid by the defendant to the plaintiff. The two types, though, are specific damages and general damages. So specific damages is like a quantifiable amount of money that you can actually specifically put a price on it. So it might be, for example, um, I was in a car accident. Um, I was in hospital for two weeks, so I had to pay for all my medical bills and I have to be compensated for two weeks worth of work that I missed, right? So that's like a specific amount of money that you can actually add up to be compensated for your suffering. General damage is a bit trickier. There's no specific price and it has to be an estimate of how much money you should be compensated for emotional suffering. So it might be I was really traumatised by this car crash um, and I had a really hard time in hospital. There's no specific amount of money that goes, oh, that's exactly right. That will perfectly compensate Molly. Um, but they'll need to figure out what's the best option to try to offer extra compensation for these people. Um, so sometimes people will try to get both types of damages or just one or the other. Then the second type is injunctions. So injunctions are orders from the court for the defendant to either do something, take an action, or to prevent them from doing an action. So it could be something like, um, you let's say there's a dispute between neighbours about a fence, which probably wouldn't actually be heard in the courts, but let's just say hypothetically that's the example. Um, a restrictive injunction prevents them from doing something. So they might say, okay, I'm going to give you a restrictive injunction which prevents you from putting up this fence. You're not allowed to build this fence. A mandatory injunction says you have to do something. So a mandatory injunction might be like, you have to take down this fence. That's like telling them to do something. You have to like um, dismantle this fence or whatever, right? So restrictive, not allowed to do something. Mandatory, you have to do something. Um, and then wrapping up our civil content. So again, three factors you need to learn. Um, the only difference is instead of cultural factors, it's now accessibility factors. So that includes cultural factors, um, but also things just in general to do with access. So things like if you live rurally, can you access the courts? Um, otherwise, those three things um, will be the same and you need to learn, again, one recent, one recommended reform from the past four years for each of those. So it adds up to be a lot of reforms, but just start doing one at a time and see how you go. If you don't get to all 12 across unit three, that's fine. That's understandable. But um, you just want to do what you can to be prepared for the exam. Okay, so we're going to actually head back over onto mentees. So if you could get that up, that would be great. I will as well. All right, so um, we're going to come back to the questions, but we're going to go over, I can find it. Oh, look at you all there. That's awesome. Um, all right, I'm going to start the countdown. Get ready to answer some questions, okay? Do fines achieve their purpose of protecting the community? So either yes, they achieve their purpose and protect the community, or no, offenders are still in the community. So put in what you think, just give it a go. Doesn't matter if you're not sure. It doesn't matter if you end up being wrong as well. All here to learn. Time's up. Well, it's quite quick, isn't it? Okay, cool. We've got majority people saying no, offenders are still in the community. That's correct. So everything's subjective. So if you, you could probably find a way to argue that maybe fines do achieve protection. 
Um, but for the most part, no, they do not because it's just making people pay them out of money. They're not removing them from society. Um, they're still out on the streets and everything like that. Um, good work, everyone. Okay, and one more. So a mandatory injunction is where the defendant is restricted from doing something. For example, they are not allowed to build a fence. There's our fence example again. All right, I'll give everyone a few more seconds to put in what they think. Don't worry about what everyone else is saying. You put in what you think. And then in a second, I will show the correct answer. All right. I'll show the correct answer. Is, oh, is it there? Yes, it is. Oh. Okay, so mandatory injunction is when they're prevented from doing something. I'm not sure which one this is actually saying is true, but the correct answer is false. Um, because if you're prevented from doing something, that would be a restrictive injunction um, or what's also called a prohibitive injunction, I think. Um, so good work. 19 people have said false. Um, don't worry if you said true. Hopefully you learned something new in there. Um, all right, I'm going to pop back in here. So um, we'll actually come back for questions because we've just had some recently, but I'll make sure before the next break we have a bit more time for questions. So keep putting them in there. Um, if you have any, I'm going to skip over our break slides because we've already had our break. Okay, but our next break will be coming up soon. Unit four. So we're halfway through the content already, which is awesome. Um, so hopefully you all, it sounds like you're still here engaged, which is awesome. But yeah, pop in those questions if you have any. So we're going to move away from our criminal law and our civil law stuff. Um, and we're going to come to... Um, stuff about Parliament and the Constitution and the High Courts, which is exciting. So um, first thing we want to learn about is the, the role of Parliament and the structure of Parliament. So first of all, we're going to start with Commonwealth Parliament, as in the federal one, the one in Canberra, which we've got a photo of here. So the lower house in federal parliament is called the House of Representatives. Um, so the lower house is where government is formed, meaning government... Um, is the political party that holds the majority of seats out of all of the members. Um, and then the leader of that party will become prime minister. So currently Labor holds a majority in the House of Representatives. So we have our prime minister, Anthony Albanese. Um, so yeah, their role is to form government, um, but also to be representative in making laws. So we elect these people into office. So it's really important that they represent our values, which I think we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, then we have the Senate as the upper house. So the role of the Senate is to act, first of all, as a house of review and as a state's house. So majority of the bills will be introduced in the lower house um, where the government is. So once it gets passed through there, it'll move up to the Senate, the upper house, and they will review this bill before passing it, before it becomes legislation. So they have to be really critical, scrutinise these bills to make sure they're representative of the people, they're appropriate and everything like that. Um, they can also initiate bills though, if they'd like. But yeah, they also act as a state's house. So the Senate um, ensures that all of the states are equally represented. So each state will have 12 senators and each territory will have two senators. So it makes sure that smaller states like Tasmania, for example, um, aren't feeling like they're being um, not represented. You know, larger states like Victoria or New South Wales aren't, you know, always having the main voice. Um, okay, then we have Victorian Parliament. So in Victorian Parliament, the lower house, the Legislative Assembly, um, very similar role to the House of Representatives. They'll form government, they'll initiate bills, and they represent us, the people. And then the upper house is the Legislative Council. So this is the same role as the Senate because it's also the upper house. Only difference is it doesn't act as a state's house because obviously it's just Victorian Parliament. So they don't have to represent Queensland or anything like that. They're all Victorian um, members of Parliament, but they'll also act as a house of review. Okay, um, next is the Crown. So this is sort of the third level of Parliament. So the Crown, which is it's very weird to say, is the King's representative. So for a very long time we've been saying it's the Queen's representative. Um, sadly, the Queen is no longer with us. So, I mean, it doesn't matter if you slip up and you say Queen's representative in your exam. I don't think anyone would take marks off you, but try to say King if you can. Um, but, yes, the Crown represents um, the King, King Charles III, 
um, because he is our head of state as a Commonwealth country. So he doesn't have time to be approving every law that we make. So our um, governor general on a Commonwealth level and our governor on a state level, their job um, is to act as a representative of the king um, and approve these laws. So that's called granting royal assent. The governor general can also withhold royal assent, so not approve these laws if they think it's appropriate. That doesn't happen very often, though. And then they also appoint executive council, which is like the prime minister and the key um, cabinet ministers as well. Okay, moving on. Ooh, okay, next is um, division of powers. So um, division of powers is when they made the constitution in 1900, um, they had to decide which parliaments would get which lawmaking powers. So they're divided up into three areas. So first of all, um, residual powers, then exclusive powers and concurrent powers. Um, so exclusive powers are only for Commonwealth Parliament. So only they have um, lawmaking power over these areas. So that's things like defence and currency. So only Commonwealth Parliament can change our currency. Otherwise, every state would probably have a different form of currency, which is a bit inconsistent. Um, then residual powers um, are powers that only the states hold. Um, the Commonwealth can't intervene in these areas. So this is things like education. So that's why every state has a different education system. You're all doing BCE, Victorian Certificate of Education. Every state has their own system. So that's why, because education is a residual power. And then there's some areas that both have power over. So these are called concurrent powers that are shared between Commonwealth and the state. So things like marriage, for example. But sometimes those concurrent areas can cause a bit of issues. Um, so if there's ever a conflict between those laws, this is where Section 109 will come into play. Um, so Section 109 of the Constitution says that when there's a conflict between a Commonwealth law and a state law, the Commonwealth law will prevail to the extent of the inconsistency. So an example of this to make it a bit easier is um, in 2013, um, ACT, which is a, their territory, but it's a state um, state parliament, they legalised same-sex marriage in 2013, which they had the power to do because marriage um, is a power shared by both parliaments, right? So they're allowed to do that. But then it became a problem because in ACT, same-sex marriage was legal. Um, but, but in 2013, Commonwealth Parliament said marriage is between a man and a woman, right? So what happens there is that they have to figure out, well, are these marriages legal? Because ACT says yes, um, but Commonwealth says no. So what happens is it goes to the High Court and the High Court says, because of Section 109, the Commonwealth law will prevail, which meant same-sex marriage was no longer legalised in ACT because they had to follow Commonwealth rules um, until obviously that changed in 2017. So, yeah, Section 109 is significant because it fixes all of these inconsistencies, which is nice, um, but it reduces the lawmaking power of the states because it's always in favour of the Commonwealth and never in favour of the states. Um, oh, my slides are being weird. Sorry, everyone. Okay, and then biocamal structure. So, um the Constitution says that um, Commonwealth Parliament has to be bicameral, which means it has to have two houses, a lower house and an upper house. Um, this is required by Section 1, but then also Section 7 and 24. Um, so this is a good thing, I would say, because it means um, if the government has a majority in the lower house, if they all vote the same way and all vote yes on a bill, it'll automatically go through. So if we had no upper house, no Senate, they wouldn't be any scrutiny or review of any of those laws, which is not good because then there's the risk that it might be unrepresentative or something. So I, so bicameral structure of Commonwealth Parliament is supposed to act as a check um, on Parliament's lawmaking abilities. Victorian Parliament is also bicameral, um, but that's not a constitutional requirement. It's actually up to the states if they want to be bicameral or not. Queensland actually has a unicameral system. They only have one house in Parliament. Um, so for this stop point only focus on Commonwealth for now. Okay, then we have separation of powers. So separation of powers um, ensures that one body doesn't have too much power. So it's split into three different areas. So we've got executive power, legislative power, and judicial power. So legislative power is lawmaking power, which Parliament has, we've been talking about a little bit. Um, judicial power is the power of the courts to enforce laws. Um, so the High Court, 
specifically as well. And then executive power is the power to administer law. So this is great in theory because it's like these three different types of um, dealing with the law are held by different bodies, which is great. It's not all in parliament or all in one body. But legislative and executive overlap a little bit, which is not so good. So that's because the prime minister um, and other members of the um, other key ministers in parliament also sit in the executive. So you've got people who are in that have executive power and legislative power, which overlap. So separation of power is great in theory, um, but you need to be aware of that overlap, which sort of minimizes um, how the separation of powers works. Okay, next is express rights. So express rights um, we have in the Constitution. We don't have a Bill of Rights or anything like America, but we do have rights in the Constitution. Um, and because they're in the Constitution, they can't be changed by Parliament. They can only be changed in a referendum. Um, so I've listed them all here. It's good to know the names of all of them. And then it would be awesome if you could learn probably two of them in depth. So, for example, when I did my exam, I think I knew all five of them. And then I knew a bit more information about freedom of religion and trial by jury. I'd recommend learning trial by jury because we've already been talking about that for Unit 3 content, so it's handy to know that for both. Um, but, yes, these express rights can only be changed at a referendum and Parliament are not allowed to make laws about them. So if Parliament made a law that said we're banning this certain religion, that would be unconstitutional and that could be resolved in the High Court and it would change that law. Speaking of the High Court, that's not a good thing to learn about, how they act as a check in Parliament's lawmaking abilities. Um, they're the only ones that can interpret and, yeah, give meaning to the words of the Constitution. So because of that, they protect the Constitution. They make sure Parliament aren't abusing their power in any ways um, when they deal with these cases. We'll talk a bit more about the High Court soon, though. Um, Okay, and then you need to know about the double majority requirement. So this is something in the Constitution that says, okay, if Parliament wants to change anything about the Constitution, they can do so um, via a referendum. But referendums are quite hard to pass. So the requirement for passing a referendum is that, first of all, a majority of voters in all of Australia, Australia say yes, um, but also a majority of voters in a majority of states say yes. So if you had like 80% of all of Australia vote yes on a referendum, but only three out of six states vote yes, you can't do that. It has to be at least four out of six states. Um, so this, yeah, is good in a way. It means the constitution can't be changed all the time. It's quite a serious process, quite hard to pass. I think um, maybe someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure eight out of 44 referendums have passed in Australia, which is not a lot. Um, and, yeah, this has been talked a lot about in the news recently. People, um, The government wants to have referendum into giving an Indigenous voice to Parliament um, and maybe in the future have another referendum about being a republic. We've actually already had one of those before and it failed, but we might have another one in our near future. Um, so, yeah. Good to know how that sort of protects the constitution. Okay, then you also need to know for this area of study a few different high court cases. I'm not going to go through them all just because every school learns different cases. There's no set list of what you need to know. Um, I've given you some examples, though. So if you haven't learned any yet or you're not sure where to start, here are some options of what you could do. Um, but you have to learn one case for each of these dot points. So one high court case in interpreting Section 724, the Roach case is a good one. Um, you need to know one referendum that either protect the constitution, so failed, or change the constitution, so it passed. So the 67 one passed, the 1999 one failed. So you just need one of them. Um, a high court case which impacted division of powers, that you could do the Brisbane case, and then international declarations and treaties dealing with external affairs power. So that comes under the dams case. That's quite a popular one to learn. So, yeah, I'm not going to cover all of them, but if you have qu any questions about these cases or what you need to know, just put them in the mentee and we'll cover them later as well. Um, okay, otherwise on to area, area study two of unit four. So we are getting there. Um, okay, so um, we've already talked about the roles of the Houses of Parliament, but you now need to know the effectiveness of them. Um, so some good things to think about are um, the roles of a minority government and a majority government. So like I said before, if there's a majority government in the Labour, in the lower house, I was thinking Labour Party, sorry, um, 
they so if they have for example 80 out of 151 seats um the laws will really easily get passed through which isn't necessarily a bad thing it means laws are made really effective uh, really efficiently really quickly um but they might not be effective because maybe they weren't debated or scrutinized enough um whereas a minority government can be good because the the bills will be really scrutinized but it means they also have to rely on um the support of minor parties and independents so for example if labor had a minority government they would have to sort of team up almost with parties like the greens for example or different independents to get their support well, it's a bit harder to pass those bills because those parties tend to be a bit more critical um, of maybe the political agendas then you want to know also about the upper house so in the senate there doesn't have to be a government majority you could have all opposition people or all independents doesn't matter but if there is um, a majority a government majority in the upper house that's what's called a rubber stamp senate um, meaning they'll pretty much automatically get passed through go through the lower house you've got labor people um, dominating the senate that'll get passed through as well when that doesn't happen and um, the government are sort of outnumbered in the Senate, that's called a hostile upper house or a hostile Senate. Um, makes it harder to pass laws, but it, again, it's a good thing because it encourages scrutiny of bills to make sure they're representative and they are appropriate. Um, yeah, we've talked a bit about representative government. So this can be ensured through um, listening to the views of the majority. So when making bills, um, members of parliament need to listen to their community and the electorates they represent. You know, what would they want? How would they vote on this bill? And then through elections. So if members of parliament aren't being representative, they can be um, voted out in the next election, which is a good way to keep these members of parliament held accountable. Um, then we've got political pressures. So um, there's a few different types here, internal, domestic and international. I won't go through them all, but you've got the slides if you want a bit more information. Um, but political pressures are just different things that put pressure on parliament to make laws or change the laws. So maybe within their own parties, or it might be through protests from other people, um, or even from overseas with international treaties or things like that. So um, encourages them to make laws. There's some restrictions on their lawmaking abilities as well though. So um, things like, for example, express rights, like we talked about, they're not allowed to make laws on express rights. Um, Section 109, so the states might make a law about tax but it com it conflicts with a commonwealth law about tax so that ta um that tax law becomes invalid which really reduces parliament's lawmaking ability um so a few different things they can't change the constitution they have to have a referendum for that so good to know some examples of things parliament are not allowed to make laws on which aren't necessarily a bad thing it's good that it's making sure they don't have too much power um, but it does restrict them in quite a few ways um, okay, now moving on to the courts and lawmaking. So you need to know about what's called the doctrine of precedent, um, which sometimes can be feel scary for some students because there's a lot of Latin words um, thrown around in here, but they they can be really helpful in the exam, so they're good to know. But let's go through them. So um, when courts make law, it's not like parliament. They don't make legislation, um, but the decisions they make in cases can become what's called precedent that will be used in future cases where the facts are similar. Um, so that's what the doctrine of precedent is. So a few principles though. So um, let's start maybe with um, my Latin pronunciation is awful. I'm so sorry. I had a legal teacher who didn't know how to pronounce them. So now I say them really wrong. As long as you know how to write them, that is fine though. So first one I'll say is star decisis, which um, translates to like what to stand by what has been decided. Um, so this just means this precedent was made by this judge when they made a decision. That decision will stand by in future cases. It'll be applied again um, to make sure that common law, which is a judge-made law, is consistent and like, reliable. Um, then we've got ratio decidendi, um, which is the reasoning for the decision. So this is the binding part of a judgment, the part that they have to follow in future cases. Then we've got obita dictum, which are things that are said in passing, that are said by the way, called by the way statements. So a judge might say, okay, here's my reasoning, here's the ratio decidendi, but by the way, you should also think about this. So they're not binding, they don't have to be applied in future cases, but they can be influential for future judges in their decision making. Um, 
Next, we've got um, persuasive versus binding precedent. Um, so persuasive precedents are ones that you're not bound to follow, but they can be really influential, whereas binding precedent, you have to follow um, decisions made by higher courts. Um, if you're bound to follow a precedent and it's a little bit unfair, there are some ways you can get out of that. So, for example, you could distinguish the facts of the case. So if you think, um, if you're a judge and you would think, oh, it's really unfair I have to follow this outdated precedent, but hold on, the facts are quite different, so I think I actually don't need to follow it anymore. Or, for example, you could reverse all the rulings if you're a higher court. A few different methods there you could read through. Um, good to know some of them. Um, next is statutory interpretations. So um, this is when a judge in a courtroom will read um, the words of parliament in legislation and they'll look, apply them in cases. So when they apply them in their cases, they give meaning to these words. So they could interpret the word weapon, for example, and they might give a really broad definition of weapon because parliament hasn't provided one. When they do that, it's changing the interpretation of the word and that interpretation becomes a precedent, will be used in future cases. Um, so yeah, good to know not only what is the doctrine of precedent, but if it's effective, because you need to evaluate like the ability of courts to make law. So precedent, for example, is great because it's consistent, it's reliable, it's predictable, but sometimes it's too binding, it's too restrictive. So courts might be afraid to make laws or make new precedents. Um, a few more things with courts making law. So judicial conservatism and activism. So a conservative judge is one who has a really narrow interpretation in lawmaking and when deciding cases. Um, so, for example, they would ignore all external factors of like the media or what the people think. And that is allowed because judges are appointed, they're not elected. So they have no obligation to represent the people, um, which might seem unfair, but if they're not elected, it makes sense, right? So they would just look at the words on the page and nothing else, um, which ensures consistency in law, um, reliability that might be seen as unfair by the people, which judicial activism is a way to be a bit more progressive in lawmaking within the courts. Um, so they are more um, excited to make new precedents, whereas conservative judge judges would be really reluctant to do so. So a good example of um, judicial activism would be in the Marbo case, which a few of you have probably studied before, either this year or last year, um, and where the High Court judges created the principle of native title, which Parliament ended up reflecting in their laws as well. So a conservative judge probably wouldn't have done that. They just would have um, stayed with what previous judges had done instead. Um, cost and time. So a few cost and time factors um, where, because with the court, uh, let's we'll start with Parliament. With When Parliament makes laws, um, they can do it whenever they want. All they need is for one member of Parliament to stand up and introduce a bill that they've drafted. The courts can't do that. They can't do that by themselves. They have to wait for a party to come to them. So that means, okay, first of all, is anyone... Has anyone noticed an inconsistency in law or anything like that that they want to bring in a legal case? Even if they do find a person who's willing to do that, can they afford it and do they have enough time? Okay, so, for example, if I um, found, you know, I was like, oh, Parliament did something unconstitutional, I want to take this to the High Court, um, I probably couldn't do that because I don't have the time to go to the High Court in Canberra, um, probably couldn't afford it as a uni student or the big legal fees of going to the high court, right? Um, so that the cost and time is a really important thing that sort of maybe reduces the court's effectiveness in lawmaking. And then requirement of standing. So even if I could afford it, do I have the right um, to bring this case forward? So let's say um, I, what I found was that parliament has banned a religion and I'm like, that goes against freedom of religion. That's an expressed right. Parliament's being unconstitutional. Um, I couldn't take this case to the court unless it personally affected me. So if I didn't follow this religion, I wouldn't be allowed to pursue this case. It might even be more than that. You might need to be like a community leader of this religion or something like that. Um, so it's good in a way that it makes sure the courts are only hearing cases from people who are really affected by issues. Um, but it might also deter people who have like legitimate cases they want heard just because they don't have standing, they don't have this special interest. Um, last thing I think, yeah, for this little bit of content is um, the relationship between courts and parliaments. So 
few different things you can talk about. Um, for example, the supremacy of parliament. So parliament is the supreme lawmaker, which means um, they have more power than the courts when it comes down to that. So they can change the jurisdiction of the courts. They can change the court's powers. Um, if they don't like a precedent the court has made, they can abrogate it, which means they overrule it, um, which is a lot of power for, for parliament to have. So that's important to talk about. Um, however, if the courts make a precedent that the, the parliament agrees with, they can codify it. So codification is when they turn it into legislation. Um, so it's not only a precedent, but now also parliament has made a law about it as well. So like I said before, the Marbo case is a really good example of that, where the courts establish the principle of native title and parliament said, we really like that, we support that. And they did that as well in their own legislation. Um, so that's all of the content for that little this portion. Um, so what we'll do is we're going to really quickly look at this practice question um, together. So um, I'll read it out and then we're going to talk about it. So a referendum proposal was voted on by the electors of Australia. 56% of all voters in Australia voted in favour of the proposal and the majority of voters in all states except Victoria, Tasmania and New South Wales voted in favour of the proposal. Was the referendum passed? justify your answer so if you could pop in um the chat i've just made it so you can see each other's um responses as well just for now um what do you think do you think this referendum would be passed um and if you can think of it why what would be your justification for that as well so i'll give you uh, a minute to have a think and then pop it in the chat once you've thought of your answer doesn't matter if it's right or wrong um, but we want to hear what you think. Yeah, don't be afraid about being wrong as well. Okay, we've got one person say so would not pass. No, only three states voted, four states required. Cool. See if anyone else wants to put anything in the chat. And then we'll look at a sample answer together. Got another no. Okay, we've got three no's so far. So keep popping in the chat if you would like. Um, but while you do that, let's look at the sample answer. So you, the, everyone in the chat so far has been correct. So this referendum would not pass. So that's a really good catch. That sort of often confuses people because a majority might sound like half of the states, but you actually need four out of six. So this referendum would not have passed. 56% 56, 56 of all voters in Australia voted yes. So this satisfies the first element of the double majority requirement outlined in section 128 of the Australian Constitution. However, because only three out of six states voted in favour of the proposal rather than the required four out of six majority, the double majority requirement has not been satisfied and thus the referendum will not have passed. Um, so, yeah, good work, everyone. I can see some more people in the chat as well. Oh, people writing full answers. That is awesome. So, um, yeah, you're all on the right track. So when it's a question like this, it's only worth three marks. So, you, so you'd have about four and a half minutes, you get 1.5 minutes per mark. So it needs to be fairly quick in your answer, right? So you would go straight away. This referendum would not have passed. One mark immediately, if you would say that, right? Make it really easy for the examiner. Then you give your reasoning. So the first thing you want to say is, okay, they satisfy the first part of the requirement. So 56% of voters voted yes. So the first part is satisfied. However, and then like lots of you saying in the chat, which is awesome, only three out of six states voted um, yes, not for, sorry, the second part hasn't been satisfied. And then put in a final reminder, overall, the referendum would not have passed. Um, so if you, it's not super long of an answer, but it's got everything you would need in there to get you those three marks. But great work, everyone. Some really awesome answers um, in the chat, which is great. Okay, so we've got six more minutes. Molly, before. sorry. Yeah, sorry. I've got a question or maybe, maybe a comment. Um, in terms of how the voters from the ACT and the Northern Territory, mm -hmm. so the two territories, my understanding is they would count 
in the majority of people of Australia, but I think it, Section 128 only applies to the six states. Is that consistent with yes. your understanding? Yes, thank you so much for bringing that up. I totally forgot. That's perfectly right. So, um, yeah, ev- the people in territory, so ACT and Northern Territory, would be counted in the first part, all of Australia, just the general vote, um, but they're not counted in the states vote. That's only for the states. Um, I think the reasoning for that, that they're not included in that, is so smaller states like um, South Australia and Tasmania so make sure they get a say in that um in that part of it. But thanks for bringing that up. That's actually a really good point. So yes, not included in that, but they are included in the general population. Thank you, Dean. That's great. Um, okay. Yeah, we've got five more minutes. So I'm going to pop back over to Menti and we've got time for a few more questions. So let me come back to the question slide. Okay. Oh, 28 questions. Cool. Come from us, we'll get them all done in five minutes, but let's get through a few of them. So um, first one, do all courts have powers of case management and is this power for both civil and criminal? Okay, so yeah, if anyone else has any points to jump in because other people might know more than me, but um, my understanding is yes. So it just so happens that you learn about case management powers for civil law, um, but... I'm pretty sure all judges would have case management powers, just meaning that they can give directions, right? So they can say, do this by this date, um, make sure to submit this document or whatever, right? If they didn't have case management powers in the magistrate's court, for example, be pretty chaotic, right? Um, And same for criminal trials. It's important that the judge can sort of manage the trial. So to answer your question, yes, um, but you just specifically have to learn about it for the civil, civil law area study. Unless if anyone um, else has another answer to that, and I have not said that correctly, let me know, but not hearing anything else. So I think that's okay for now. Okay. Um, next one, how would we distinguish between the three pretrial procedures? Good question. Yeah, this is often a tricky thing because pleading sort of stands out by itself because um, it is specifically about the statement of claim, the statement of defence. Um, that happens at the very start, but often the overlap between discovery of documents and exchange of evidence can be a bit confusing for people, which I definitely experienced in year 12. Um, The way I like to try to distinguish those two in my mind is um, discovery of documents is sort of for everything, right? So for things like medical bills, um, pay slips, like... um, I don't know, any sort of form of written document or things that are going to be submitted for evidence. Um, whereas exchange of evidence is, it's weird how they've called it exchange of evidence. It makes it a little bit confusing, but that's specifically for witnesses, the witnesses that you're going to have in the trial. So you would give, if I'm a plaintiff, I would give the defendant a list of all the witnesses I'm going to have. They would do the same for me. And we'd also give a record of that to the courts. So it's similar to discovery that we're exchanging the documents that we have, but Exchange of evidence is specifically just witnesses. That's a good way to try to separate it in your mind. They have the same purposes, though, so don't worry about distinguishing between the purposes because they are the same, which is to try to reach um, an out-of-court settlement and to reduce the element of surprise. But does anyone else have any advice about how to distinguish between them? doesn't matter if not, but Rakea or anyone else? Yeah, perfectly. Thanks, Molly. Okay, all good. Thank you. All right, let's do one or two more. Okay, how much detail should we know about cases? Um, Good question. So I would say the most important thing for those cases you need to learn, so the high court ones that we gave some examples of, um, don't worry too much about the little details of the cases um, because there's so much, right? There's so many so much information about them out there, so many things that the judges said, you can't be expected to know it all. Um, but what's most important is sort of the issue at hand, why the case happened, um, the, the decision, and then most important would be the significance. So, for example, um, I, I learnt the 1999 referendum as my example in Year 12. Um, I learnt that the 1999 referendum was about um, Australia changing the preamble to the constitution and then becoming a republic, um, separating ourselves from the Commonwealth. So that's sort of what was it about, right? 
And then the outcome, so the outcome was that it failed, right? It didn't pass, didn't satisfy the double majority requirement. And the significance of that, the most important, is that because it failed, it protected the constitution because the constitution didn't change as a result of it. So what it was about, what was the outcome and the significance? But if you had to prioritise any of those, prioritise the significance because that's where most of your marks would be coming from. Um, Yeah, Rakea, anything else to add? about that no all right cool we're at four o'clock now so time for another bit of a break i know there's still lots of questions there but we'll get through some more when we are back um so same thing we'll come back at 4 15 and then get through our last bit of content and some exam tips and a few more questions thanks everyone Hi all, my name is Liam, where I'll be leading you through the Sociology Exam Revision Session for 2023. I'll be going through all the dot points on the study design from the start of Unit 3, which is Australian Indigenous Culture, to Unit 4, Social Movements, that you will have just finished. This session will be an intensive and include tips and tricks on how to answer questions and tackle the exam, so when you enter the exam room, you'll feel less nervous. So you should definitely come to this revision session as I completed sociology in 2020, so not that long ago, and the study design hasn't changed since then, and I really enjoyed this subject. I also provided the revision session last year for this subject as well, and made some successful and accurate predictions on what would be on the exam. So hopefully I can do the same thing and provide my insights to what will be on the exam this year. What I love about sociology is that the research is up to you, and each area of study has only a couple of theories. So once you have all of them memorised like the back of your hand, it is simply a matter of tailoring your answers to the exam question. The sociology exam requires you to write for many essays, but with practice, they aren't nothing to worry about. A study tip of mine is to just continue to practice writing your essays and going to your teacher for feedback as well as that collecting your past sacks and taking on the previous feedback that you have received. And then with all of that combined, using your sacks and the information within those sacks, extracting that and putting it all on a Google Doc and just having that beside you at all times, reading it, refreshing your memory on all the evidence you have for your case studies. So when you go into that exam room, all of that information is fresh and all those statistics and all of that is just ready there for you to just write on. Thank you so much for watching. We are so very much excited to see you at the VCE exam revision series for this year. Hey, my name is Bridget and I'll be taking the economics exam revision session. So I'm really excited to walk through all of those key pieces of content included in the study design dot points for economics and also some fantastic tips on how to maximize your marks when it comes up to the exam so that you can do as best as you possibly can in economics this year. 
My study tip for the end of the year exams would be to introduce some kind of active recall into your studying. You can probably look this up on Google, but it is a really proven technique to use. So you might want to incorporate flashcards or questions that you write for yourself that really cause you to recall that knowledge and not necessarily just recognize it like you would if you were maybe reading a textbook or reading over some notes. Thanks everyone, wait one more minute and then we'll get into the rest of the content. Okay, we're at 4.15 now, so I think we'll keep going and we are almost through all of the content. So thank you everyone for still being here and listening. We really appreciate it and hope this is helping and we'll get to some exam tips and some more questions soon as well, which is exciting. Um, but before we do that, we're going to talk about law reform and why laws change and how they change. Um, so first thing you want to know are the, some reasons for law reform. Um, so this is a list of all of them here, um, well, most of them anyway. Um, I would recommend like understanding all of them, but having a few key examples, um, maybe about three, that would, I think, be plenty for the exam. So some good ones to know, for example, changes in beliefs, values and attitudes. Um, so for example, I've got here the example of same-sex marriage again, um, in 2017, Commonwealth Parliament legalised same-sex marriage, which is an example of law reform, and that was the result of people's values changing over the, over time. So when the Marriage Act was first made, um, majority of people probably would have voted against same-sex marriage. By 2017, that had changed, so it was time for the laws to update as people's values had updated. Um, lots of other examples here, but I think that is probably the main one to know. Um, next, you want to learn about how we we as individuals can influence um, law reform. When I say individuals, I don't mean judges or lawyers. I mean just you and I as Australian people. Um, so petitions are one way to do that. Um, so plenty of you have probably signed a petition before in your lifetime, maybe not. Um, there's both paper petitions, like we've got in this photo, and um, virtual ones. So these days, just click of a button and you can sign a petition to support a cause. So um, petitions only need one signature to be considered by Parliament. But obviously, the more signatures you have, the more likely um, your, it is to be considered by parliament maybe turn into actual law reform so it's a great method because it's cheap and it's simple doesn't really cost any money um, especially online um, people can just spread it through social media or things like that um, and even if it doesn't lead to laws being changed it can at least generate public awareness about these issues um, some weaknesses though people might be reluctant to add personal information like their full name or address or phone number um, so that might deter people from signing a petition and even if you had 100,000 signatures, there's no obligation for Parliament to um, implement the reform that you want to happen. Um, the, yeah, like I said, the more signatures you have, it increases the likelihood of success, um, but you never know. Um, it's up to Parliament if they want to accept it or not. Um, also, if there, are, if there are two different um, petitions that conflict with each other, that reduces their effectiveness. Um, you might have one petition that says, maybe last year, for example, um, send school students back to school during lockdowns, right? And then you might have another one that says, no, we want to protect our student safety, keep virtual learning. So if they sort of conflict with each other, it's hard for Parliament to figure out what the views of the majority are. So they probably wouldn't implement one or the other. Um, next to demonstrations. So these are protests. Um, and demonstrations are a great way to get the attention of parliament and hopefully lead to some law reform um so 
they can also get really good media attention, especially if they're um, well attended. Um, sometimes members of parliament can even attend as well and just raise general awareness about the certain issues. So good to know an example of demonstrations. Lots of them happened, um, have happened in the past few years. You've got climate protests, um, anti-lockdown, anti-vaccine protests, um, Black Lives Matter protests, um, reproductive rights protests, lots of different ones. Um, some not necessarily about Australian issues, um, but in support of other countries as well. But obviously they're less likely to actually lead to war reform in Australia as well. Um, also, if demonstrations and protests um, cause inconvenience um, or if they're violent, they're less likely to be successful. Um, so, for example, um, a lot of the climate strikes in the last few years not all of them but a few of them have had quite extreme measures of people for example I think one year someone glued themselves to tram tracks or something like that in the city and while you know it's probably for a very valid cause of like saving the environment all it really did was the the media got attention of it but in a negative light and just said how people were annoyed that they couldn't go to work um and people weren't taking them seriously just because they were frustrated by it, right? So if you're inconveniencing people, probably not the best way to get Parliament's attention. Um, you want it to be peaceful and law-abiding and everything like that. Um, you can also use the courts to implement law reform, but it's a bit trickier because um, it takes a lot of time and money to go to the courts and the higher court especially. Um, but it is possible, like we saw with the Marbo case, for example, it's an example of law reform through the courts. Um, and judges have and the courts have a relationship with parliament, even though they're independent of each other. Um, precedents made by the courts can get the attention of parliament um, and encourage them to codify their precedents, turn it into legislation. So that is an option. If people had the time and money to invest, um, they could go to the courts to encourage law reform. Um, okay, now we talk about the role of media. So two types of media, traditional media and social media. Um, and it's important that you know about both of them. So traditional media, I would say, are things like um, newspapers, like we've got here, um, TV and radio, might be a few other things as well, but those are the main types. Um, and they can be very useful in, like, um, even changing the views of the people, um, can sort of bring light to certain issues, spread awareness as well. Members of parliament can be interviewed on TV or radio or things like that um, to keep them yeah, accountable and being talking to the public. Um, but sometimes there can be flaws in the media, um, especially if there's too um, much ownership over the media by like one group or one person, um, which often happens in the media. So they, if I owned like all these different newspapers, I would be able to put my political views onto there, right? Whether it was whether if you're left wing or right wing, doesn't matter. Too much bias in the media is not a good thing either way. Um, so you need to be weary when you're reading media. Is this biased or is it just the facts that they're giving me? And then social media, which has biases as well. But social media can be really effective in spreading awareness for things and very quickly as well. Um, just, you know, right on your fingertips. You can share information, share petitions, um, share infographics about things, share videos of protests, lots of different things um, that can spread awareness and get attention of members of parliament as well. But yeah, you always need to be careful on when information is accurate. Can you rely on it? Um, or is it misleading um, and not giving you the full picture of something? Um, next, we'll talk about role of the VLRC. So the VLRC is the Victorian Law Reform Commission. Their job is to investigate um, the need for law reform. So um, the what will happen is par Parliament's too busy to investigate the need for law reform. They're too busy making laws and doing their own thing. So they will say to the VLRC, we want to figure out if law should change about, let's say, education, right? Should we change the VCE system? We don't have the time to do it, but we want you to investigate it. So they'll give those instructions to the VLRC they will go away and conduct research in whatever area they've been assigned. Um, so they'll be given what's called the terms of reference, which will outline their instructions, the deadlines, the scope of what they have to investigate. Um, they will take that time, normally around six months or a year, can be shorter or longer though, depending on how um, big the project is. They'll go do that research. So, so they'll do things like um, 
hold consultations so the public um, can submit their opinions on things and they can get submissions so people can give written submissions about um, their areas of expertise, um, but also just everyday people as well if it's affecting the community. Um, so they'll get all that research, they'll get expert opinion and just everyday people's opinions, um, gather that together and they'll make recommendations for law reform. Um, these are available online. You don't need to read them, but if you're curious, they're all there. They're often very long, like I'm talking 600 plus pages long. So don't spend your time reading through them when you're studying, but they're interesting to see what sort of law reform recommendations um, they do recommend. So those recommendations will be written up in a report and they'll be given to parliament. Parliament will read through them and then decide if they want to implement these recommendations or how many of them they want to implement. Um, they normally do listen to the BLRC. They're sort of, they're a reliable, trustworthy body um, that's putting time and effort and money into this research, but there's still no obligation for parliament um, to investigate that, right? So that's definitely a weakness that um, they could put in a year of work and then parliament just says, no, thanks. We don't actually want to go down that route. We want to do this instead, um, which, yeah, might be seen as a waste of time or money. Um, okay, then you have to know either, and you don't need to learn both, um, but parliamentary committees or royal commissions. So these are both law reform bodies like the VLRC. Um, but, yeah, make sure you only learn one of them, don't learn both. The questions will always say, for example, evaluate the role of either a parliamentary committee or a Royal Commission. It'll give you the choice. So you only need to know one of them. Um, I'm not going to cover them today just because you don't need to know both. It will be up to you to decide which one you want. Um, but I've put here, it's really important you understand these things. So the purpose of them, um, why they exist as a body, what they're trying to achieve, their processes, how do they go about um, recommending a reform, strengths and weaknesses, do you think they're um, effective in doing what they need to be doing and an example. So you need a recent example, again, the past four years, so from 2018 to 2022, um, about a recommendation of law reform they have made. It can either be a successful example but it, or it might not be. I would say it's probably easier to have a successful example because then you can use that as a strength and say, look, here's this, here's this successful example of how they achieve law reform. But you don't have to. Um, it's totally fine as well if you have an example that either failed or is still being um, adopted and decided about. But, yes, make sure you learn one of them as well. Okay, last content dot point. We've done it. We've managed to get through all of it, which is great. Um, but the very last thing is to think, okay, these are all the ways you can try to encourage law reform, but do the parliament and courts do a good job of implementing law reform? Um, so a few things to think about. For parliament, um, thinking about the fact that they are elected, which means if they're responding to law reform, they will be representative in doing so, which the courts will not be. So that's important. Um, Parliament can be quite quick and proactive in investigating the need for law reform. They can say, hey, VLRC, go do this, um, whereas courts have to wait for a case to come to them instead. Um, but, yeah, because judges aren't elected, they can be a lot more active in making decisions and making changes because they don't have to worry about not being voted in again because they're not voted in, they're appointed instead, so they're not going to lose their seat if something's a bit controversial. Um, and, yeah, and then even if the courts don't lead to successful change, they can at least raise awareness and maybe get the attention of Parliament as well, which is really important in encouraging law reform. But that is it for the content. So we're going to head back over to Menti and I'm going to ask you this question. What do you think is the best method um, individuals can use to influence law reform? And there's no right answer at all for this. So... Let me just get over to the right slide. Here we go. So copy in what you think. Um, we have either um, demonstrations, petitions, the courts, social media, the VLRC, something else. Um, yeah, pop in what you think. And, again, there's no right answer. I'm just curious to see what everyone thinks. So I'll give you 30 seconds or so to pop that in. Okay, so demonstrations is um, holding the majority at the moment. Bit of social media, petitions, courts, VLRC. 
parliamentary committees, cool. Mixture, combination, I like that. But there's no one right option. Like if we only relied on social media, we probably wouldn't get much done, right? So it's good to have a combination of multiple things, I think. Okay, that is great to see. So interesting to see what you all think there, but no right answer, but I think it's important for you to think about, like evaluate them. What do you think the most important um, method for influencing law reform is? Because that's something that might come up in the exam. Um, all right, I'm going to come back over here and we will have more time for questions. First, we're going to talk about some study tips. So I'll share some of my tips and then I'll ask probably Rakea and Dean and Sarah as well if they have other tips to share. Then we'll look at some practice questions and then we'll go back over the questions you've asked in Menti. Okay, so these are some things to do in the next however long it is before your exam, six-ish weeks, depending on um, yeah, when your exams start. Um, obviously, to try to put in as much effort as you can and stay consistent, think, try to think of it as um, a marathon and not a sprint, um, which just means don't do don't do straight away 12 hour days every day um you know punishing yourself if you didn't do this practice exam don't do that it's not a sprint um but a little bit of effort effort each day every second day will get you where you need to be um good to think about your goals as well um every student's a bit different you know what would you like to what what is your goal so your goal might be finish the exam your goal might be um to Get a C on the exam. Get an A plus might be the certain study score. Um, so that's important for you to think about in order to decide how much effort you think you're capable of putting in. Um, good thing to just have a list of all the topics you need to go over. So a great place to do this is the, the legal study design. So if you just Google VCE legal studies study design, um, it should come up. I'm sure lots of you already have a copy of it already. And use it as a checklist. Have I revised? We've covered all of it today. So hopefully this will give you um, revision for all of that. But as you do your own revision as well, you can use that as a checklist to come back to. And there we go. That's the next dot point. Study design. Share the load. So good if you have people around you to help you with your studying, friends in your legal class, your parents who can read your cue cards. If you don't have um, someone around you to help you, um, you could, you know, read out your notes to your pet or to your wall or mirror or something like that you know you don't have to have someone there but it's nice to talk it out loud and I would say if you can teach something it means you understand it so you know pretend to teach your sister all about parliamentary committees or something like that um, and it will help you remember what you've said as well another important thing make sure you take breaks and take care of yourself um, your health both physical and mental is just as important, more important than all of this stuff, right? So take care of yourself and reward yourself as you go as well. Got a few more tips and then I'll pass over um, to, actually, no, I might pause there because those are sort of general bits of advice. So first of all, okay, do you have anything to add for like general study tips? Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, just go echoing what Molly said about the study design. I know that there are like previous exams. I did a lot of them when I was in school and I found that it really helped me. And what else helped me is going on the Vika site and looking at previous exams and the feedback that the markers have. A lot of the times they do have questions similar to the exam. So have a look at those questions, have a look at how many marks were allocated to that question and what you need to cover. For example, if it question has three marks obviously you need three points to get the full marks but it's really helpful to have a look at those um everything else I think is perfect and I will pass on to Dean or Sarah if you guys have anything else to add on um I can jump in um I think that yeah I think I think they're definitely some of the key points um I guess for me the one important thing was having a really good routine during my exam period. So, um, casting my mind back to when I when I did VCE, but also, you know, I think this it's important right through with, you know if, when you get to uni as well and sit those exams. Like really, you know, for me, I like going for a walk, for example, in the morning, or some people might like going to a gym, or some people might like playing PlayStation at night to reward themselves. Um, don't do too much of that um, if you can help it. But having some kind of routine and eating healthy or, or doing something I think is really important. 
And then I guess secondly, um, practice, practice, practice is 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 what I would say. Um, trying trying to do as many previous exams um, as possible within um, the current study design, as Rakaia said, I think is is really important. And then thirdly, um, I guess for me, I always uh, share the load was was really important too. So. Um, speaking to my my younger brother, trying to teach him about legal studies or math or whatever the subject was, or you know, if no one's around, speaking to a wall, speaking to a pet, that that works too. So if you feel like you can explain a concept to um, someone or something, um, I, I I think that just becomes you can just retain that information um, a lot better, and it becomes a lot clearer in your mind. And I think it, it's just a lot easier in the exam when you feel like you've you've explained it. Um, to someone else. So that, that were probably the three things that I carried through, you know, uh, during my VC and, and right through my, my studies at, at university. I don't know if Sarah had anything else that, that's probably, probably my, my three. Well, I think I would just add, so for me, what was really drummed into me when I was doing my exams is look at what the question's asking you to do. Like, is it asking you to evaluate? Are you being asked to describe? Are you being asked to analyse, list? Yeah, really consider what the question is asking you and then respond appropriately. Um, I think time management during exams is really important as well. So try when you're doing your practice questions to, you know, time yourself or give yourself a time limit and say, right, I've got 10 minutes to answer this question and see how far you can get in that 10 minutes. Um, and then finally, um, yeah, just on looking after yourself, you know, sleep is really, really important. Don't underestimate, you know, how important it is to, to get you know really good sleep, particularly you know the nights before your exams, don't stay out late, late cramming. Awesome, thank you, everyone. Those are very good um, tips that I think yeah apply for legal, but every other subject as well. So that is awesome. Um, okay, a few more things that are specific to the legal exam, or I guess all VC exams in general. Um, mindset is really important. Um, I liked to go into the exam with sort of a plan of attack, which is another thing here of feeling ready, feeling prepared. And, you know, you don't open and think, oh, two hours of all these legal questions. I don't know where to start. But doing enough practice to get you to the point where you feel confident enough. You know, you don't need to be an expert in legal studies. I was still really nervous before my legal exam. But you feel confident enough that you know what you need to do. Um, so what uh, the method I used in the exam, for example, this is not what you have to do, but it's good to create your own system. I started with, because you get 15 minutes reading time, right? We're not allowed to write anything. So it's really good to um, decide what questions look good and easy, what ones might be trickier. So what I did was I started with what I thought was the easiest question. Um, so this might be a small question, like two or three marks. It might be a bigger question, but whatever you would determine to be an easy question, because then you start with a bit of a confidence boost. You get it out of the way really quickly because it doesn't cause any problems for you. Then I did, I didn't do the 10 marker next, but I did a big question, like a eight mark question. Um, or you might just decide then, to just go start to finish, um, or you might do section B and then section A. It doesn't matter what you do, but some sort of plan that you you know what you're going to do when you get in there, or you can even decide this um, during the reading time. But, yeah, like um, Rekha said before, really good to go through past exams, see sort of what to expect. Um, and a few other things, avoid cramming. We sort of already talked about that, though. This is sort of specifically for legal or maybe like humanities subjects. Um, First of all, always include in Section B examples for the scenario. So if you don't already know, um, Section A of the exam will be, it'll all be short answer questions. Um, section A might have short answer questions by themselves. They might have made up scenarios, real scenarios. But Section B will always have case studies and scenarios in there, um, sometimes real, sometimes made up. Um, in Section B, every question you have to use the case study you might not have a question that asks specifically for case study, use it anyway. They're sort of trying to trick you, which is a bit mean in section B. Section A, you don't have to do that. Section B, you do. So if it says, let's say you've got a case study, you've got the Marbo case, and then it says, define the doctrine of precedent. It might have asked you anything about the Marbo case, but good to mention it even really briefly. Say doctrine of precedent is this, um, as happened in the Marbo case. And that's it. Really nice, quick and easy, right? So, but section B, remember your examples. That's really important. But looking through past exams will help with that. And then task words are really important. So 
try to see what's the difference between identify and evaluate or compare and distinguish. So we won't go through all of them now, but maybe maybe if you've got questions about task words, pop them into Menti because we will have more question time. Um, but passwords are really important. So that's the first step when you read a question. What does it want me to do? Um, and then here's some things, I'll go through all of it, but things the examiners have said, um, which it's good to see what they've told students before because mistakes that students make in past exams tend to come up again and again. So don't be that person that doesn't read these tips and does these mistakes again. Try to avoid it by reading what they've said. So things like um, students should use um, paragraphs and extended responses. That's advice they've given. They're the ones marking your exams to so try to do that. Um, you don't need a definition unless it asks it of you, right? Um, so, yeah, I won't go through them all, but it's there if you need them. Um, but really good thing to do is just search up PCE legal exam reports and they'll be all there online. So read through them, see what advice they give. Um, before we um, get through some practice questions, um, does anyone have any other tips specifically for like the legal exam? Um, probably Rakea specifically, but if anyone has anything, chime in. I was just going to say, uh, like with the study tips, it really depends on how you learn personally. If you're more of a visual person, I would recommend doing like a Venn diagram or some sort of a visual thing that you remember it by. Or if you're more like me, I like to do repetition. So I had a lot of cue cards and really get over and over again. And it will really get stuck in my head. So if you kind of know what kind of a learner you are and that's how you should study, um, everyone is different. So I advice and tips won't apply to anyone. But if you know yourself and you're way of studying it would really help and the other thing is um when you are doing your practice exams give the practice exam back to your teacher back to a friend to have a look over so that that can they can give you their opinion as well oftentimes when they say something that you haven't thought of before it will get stuck in your head and you can use that as an example in your exam as well I know for me I did that a lot in my exam and really really helped me awesome thanks Rakea um Dean or Sarah, you've already given lots of awesome advice, but is there anything else before we look at practice questions that you want to add? Nope. Awesome. Thank you. All right, let's keep going. So we'll look at two or three um, practice questions and then we'll sort of wrap up and look at some, do sort of final Q&A before we finish. So this is the first one here. So this is a criminal question. Um, these are all from actual past exams from VPAS, so you can always look up um, these in past exams if you want to as well. But I'll read it out first of all. So John has been charged with an indictable offence. He has pleaded not guilty. The victims are worried about giving evidence at the upcoming trial, which is expected to last for six weeks. John's lawyer has recommended that John should apply to the court for a sentence indication and consider pleading guilty. Explain one reason why a sentence indication may not be appropriate in this case for three marks. So again, three marks are only four and a half minutes, so not heaps of time. So you've got to be ready and know what you need to do. So first thing I would think is what's my task word? So my task word here is explain. So that means um, don't just identify or list something. So if you just said not appropriate because this, that's probably not enough to get you three marks, right? Need a little bit of depth, but it's still not an extended response. Next thing I'd be looking for other keywords. So one reason. So um, don't make the mistake of giving more than they ask for. You won't lose marks, but what they'll do is they'll ignore your second reason, which means you might not gain extra marks because you don't have enough depth for your first answer. Um, and then why it may not be appropriate. Some people might make the mistake of saying why it is appropriate. Don't do that. You wouldn't get any marks. So in this one, 26% of students got zero marks. It's quite a lot. A quarter of people got no marks at all. I would say always give the question a go. Even if you're like, I have no idea, write something and try to use, you know, critical thinking skills and you might end up getting a few marks in there. So give everything a go is what my advice would be. Um, but they've said specifically to achieve full marks, a comprehensive explanation. So there we go. That's the task, right? Comprehensive explanation needs a little bit of depth. Um, you can't just list your reason. Of one reason specific to John's case, it has to be specific to his case as well. So if you had just said um, sentence indications may not be appropriate um, when 
blah, 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 if, if it's too serious of a case or something like that. You wouldn't get three marks because you need to use this specific case, right? They've said in this case. So that might just be using the name John instead of the word accused or offender, right? So just little things like that that will help you. Um, some people said a sentence indication wasn't appropriate because he'd pleaded not guilty. Not quite right. Um, they want, um, I think there's a sample one here. So a, an example of what you might say um, is it may pressure him into feeling like he needs to plead guilty when that's not the case. So if he's not prepared to plead guilty, it probably wouldn't be appropriate. So this is a really good sample answer because the first sentence just says, here is the reason why, right? And that's your first mark there. And then they get to three marks because they have the justification. They're also using the name John. They're being specific to the case study, which is why this would be a good answer. So I won't read it out now, but you've all got access to the slides and also the exam reports online. So feel free to have a look at that as well. But otherwise, let's keep going. Um, also, I saw someone asked in the chat what the car exam is this from. Good question. I should put the year in there. Um, I think it's this about the 19. 2019, did you yep. say? Oh, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, I should put them in there, but yeah, we'll hopefully try to tell you which ones they are. If not, um, you can always just, there's not that many exams. I think 2018 is the most recent. Um, um, sorry, like since this, the new study design started in 2018. So they'll all be from 2018 onwards. Um, okay, next one. So this is for civil law. So I'll read this one out. Um, Zena bought a secondhand dress for $300 for her year 12 formal. She took it to her local dry cleaning store, no guarantees, to get it cleaned before the formal. When Zena went to pick up the dress four days later, she was told that the store did not have any record of her dress. No guarantees has refused to answer Zena's calls or emails. Zena shared her story with a local newspaper, and since then, at least 12 other people have come forward with similar stories. Recently, Zena went past the store and noticed that it seemed to be permanently closed. Zena wants to claim the full cost of her dress from no guarantees. Discuss the appropriateness of the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal, VCAT, in resolving the dispute between Zena and no guarantees. Okay, so this is a bit of a um, longer question, but you've got a case study and it's a discuss question with five marks. So five marks is a little bit more, not quite an extended response. I'd say extended response is everything over six marks, so seven to ten. Um, but discuss as a task word means you need to sort of put forward an opinion but consider two sides of something. It's similar to the word evaluate but not needing as much depth to it. So if you were discussing um, the appropriateness of ECAT, you need to sort of give two sides and say it would be appropriate because blah, 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 and it would be not appropriate because blah, blah, blah. That doesn't mean you need to have a 50-50 split of reasons why it's good or bad, but you need to have both sides in there. If you had only good things about VCAT, you wouldn't get full marks for this question. Um, again, you need to be specific to this case study. So you need to be saying Xena and no guarantees and things like that that will help you um, get as close to five marks as possible. So here's some tips about what they would have expected. Um, you don't have to put in all of these points, but things like um, some things that are specific to the case, right? So the, she was only seeking $300 in damages, um, which is quite... Um, a small claim, so probably VCAT would deal with that instead of the courts. Um, she's a year 12 student, so probably couldn't afford expensive legal fees of the courts, so another good reason why um, VCAT would be an appropriate option. Um, but they may be difficult to deal with because they're not answering her calls and not being very cooperative. So maybe the courts would be a better option for that. And there's a few other things, but that's why it's really important to stay really close to the case that they've given you, whether it's real or hypothetical. Um, okay, and there's a sample one as well, and you've got the slide, so you can look through that as well. Um, one more question we're going to look at, and I picked this one because it's quite a low average. So 21% of people got zero marks, and the average was 2.6 out of 6. So I'll read it out. The use of parliamentary, com parliamentary committees and royal commissions serves a number of valuable purposes. Referring to one recent example of a recommendation for law reform, explain one strength and one weakness of either a parliamentary committee or royal commission in influencing a change in the law. So 
Um, this one of the questions that might feel a bit overwhelming, right? So you really want to break down exactly what do they want and what do I need to do to get six marks. Um, so they've given what normally when they give you a quotation or like a statement, it's putting forward an argument and they're wanting you to reflect on it and think if you agree. Um, so this quote is saying parliamentary commission, oh sorry, parliamentary committees and royal commissions are a good thing. They're valuable, they have a purpose and they achieve that purpose, which you might agree with, but you might disagree and say, no, they're actually not that effective in implementing law reform. Um, notice how this says parliamentary committee or royal commission. So you only need one of them, remember. Um, but you need a few things to get six marks. You need um, to give a recent example of a recommendation they've given. So your recent example of one of these things, one strength and one weakness. So together, that's only three things, which tells me three things, it's six marks worth, so about two marks worth per thing I need to do. So instead of just saying, here's a strength, I need to give detail about what that strength actually means or why it's important. So get, to get that depth in there, but then you've got a little checklist for yourself. Here are three things I need to do, and then you can move on. Um, so six marks seems like a lot, but it's not too scary when you break it down into a little checklist. That's what I used to love doing for myself to try to manage these questions. Um, but yeah, already talked about that's what you need to do. And there are some notes about sample responses and some issues in, sample, in some of the answers as well. Okay, um, that is the last question we're going to look through. So two things we're gonna do, I'm gonna jump back into Menti quickly. Um, and we're going to do that little word cloud again that we did at the start. So I think that should be in here. Um, we're not quite done. We'll have got more time for questions, but put in here again, how are you feeling now? Hopefully not as stressed or overwhelmed if you are understandable, but hopefully you're feeling motivated, encouraged, confident, but pop some words there. Motivated, awesome. That is great to see. Confident, like feeling better. That is great. You know, we don't expect you to feel like, oh, I know everything now, right? It's like I said, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, but hopefully you're feeling like you've got somewhere to go now. You're feeling comfortable with the content that you're ready to do some practice questions and things like that. Um, someone's feeling tired, understand. It's very rainy today as well. You have a gloomy day, but hopefully we haven't been boring you. Um, okay, this is good. This is really good to see. So um, before we have some time for the final questions, we have got in here, we'll find a reminder we've got more sessions happening over the next three days. So don't forget, if you're doing any of these subjects, sign up for some extra support. Um, but we actually have, before we do questions, a survey for you guys. So I think this QR code should send you there. Um, but Rakea, have you got the link if you could pop that in the chat as well? Awesome, thank you. So um, we'll give you a few minutes to do that. And at about 4.54-ish, we'll do one more Q&A before we wrap up for today. So pop, up, pop on some music, um, fill out the survey, and then we'll um, do our final questions from there. One thing I forgot to say, sorry, everyone. If you fill out the survey, you will go in the draw to win a $50 voucher as well. So hopefully that's a bit of incentive to fill it out. But all right, sorry, keep going. I won't disturb you and I'll check in with you soon.
Okay, hopefully most of you have filled it out by now. Um, if not, keep the link there um, and you can still fill it out as we're finishing up. Um, so, yeah, time now for some final questions before we finish. So um, I can see I think someone's raised their hand as well. I don't know if that was a mistake, but if you've got questions, pop them in here. Um, no, whoops, I didn't mean to end the presentation. Um, go back. Okay, 36 questions. So that's really good. You guys have asked so many questions. I'm sorry, we probably won't get through them all today, um, but we'll get through as many as we can right now. Um, okay, I'm going to... Oh, okay, what's happening here? Um, okay, how do we link the presumption of innocence to the burden and standard of proof? Um, so that is a really good question because the um, in criminal law, the standard of proof... Well, and the burden of proof is an example of presumption of innocence. So a good way to link these together is to explain that the presumption of innocence, which is about people being treated as innocent until proven otherwise, um, the prosecution having the burden of proof, so having to prove the facts of the case, takes that off the shoulders of the accused, right? So if I've been charged um, with an offence, um, the fact that I, what happens is they have to prove my guilt beyond reasonable doubt, but I don't have to prove my innocence, right? If I was treated as a guilty person, I would be the one being having to say, no, I'm innocent, trust me, here's why, right? But they have to, it's the other way around. So the prosecution has to prove my guilt based beyond reasonable doubt, which is a really high standard of proof. So that's how, it, that's a really good question. Link them together, that can be a really good example of the presumption of innocence. Um, okay, then is it better to know many points or a few but in detail? Yeah, that's um, a good question. It really depends on um, what bit of content you're talking about. Um, if you're sort of running out of time with your revision um, and you're feeling like, okay, I'm not going to learn everything, absolutely fine to just have a few bit in detail. Um, the questions tend to be fairly broad in exam anyway, right? They're not asking, um, what is this one really specific thing that the VLRC does? It'll be like, what's the role of the VLRC? So if you need to just know a few in depth and detail like strengths and weaknesses, that's fine. Um, but ideally try to know the other details as well. Um, an example might be with the express rights. Um, start with just learning what they are or like knowing two of them in depth. But then once you've got that done, learn all of the learn what sections of the constitution they come from. So start with just a few, but then see if you can build up as you keep revising. Would you say the same thing, Rekha, or do you have any other advice for that? Or anyone else, Dean or Sarah too? I think it's the same. I think for me personally, I knew like one or two cases really well and I kind of knew a little bit of the other ones, but mostly focused mm -hmm. on really few. Yeah, awesome. Um, okay, I answered that. From what I know, VCAT is formal and legally binding, but wouldn't this contradict how mediation isn't legally binding? Okay, yeah, so that's a good question. So what VCAT does is it uses three different um, processes. So what will happen is VCAT will start with mediation, which you're right, is not legally binding initially, um, and they'll see if that works. And if mediation works, cool, they'll just finish it there, um, which isn't legally binding unless they go and seek a way for it to become binding. Um, if mediation doesn't work, then they go to a compulsory conference. And then if that doesn't work, it goes to their final hearing, which will be binding. So good question. You're right, mediation is not binding, um, but it's just one of their earlier processes that they have. But the final hearing in VCAT will be binding instead. Good question there. Um, recommended number of cases to learn. Okay, so good question. I would start with just the ones required in the study design. Um, so it'll say one high court case about this. Um, that's sort of the bare minimum, right? Because they can actually ask you questions about those cases in the exam. Anything else is just a bit of a bonus, right? Um, so it's good, like some people might learn cases for section 109 of the constitution, but you don't need to have them, right? So um, there's no perfect number but use the study design as a checklist, go through them um, to try and figure out which ones you need to know. Um, but, yeah, don't feel like you need to know lots and lots and lots. It's good to just know the content as well. Okay, time for 
one or two more. Might see if there's more. Um, I'll answer this one. Adverse costs only for civil or criminal as well. Um, good question. I think only for civil. I'm not sure, Rakeja, you need the answer to this one. Um, I think it's for both, but in civil it's called adverse costs and in criminal it's called auto costs, but you won't need to know that for the exam. Awesome. Thank you. I, I knew you'd have the answer. That's good. That's helpful. Um, okay, let's do one or two more. Um, difference between VLASs and others. I might not answer that for now just because um, that's specific to what one you learn. Okay, this is one everyone could answer. What would you, would you say prioritise practice exams over focusing on revising? My personal preference, what I did is I started with revising content and feeling comfortable with it. And then I spent most of my time after that on practice exams because you can learn in the practice exams. You sort of learn as you go. Um, but um, I'll pass it over to Rakea or Dean or Sarah, like what your method would have been in high school or what you would recommend. There's no right answer, but any words of wisdom? Um, for me, I kind of revised a little bit and I did a practice exam to see what I need to focus on. And if there was certain things that I didn't know that well, I will go and revise on that more. But if there's things that I already knew, I wouldn't really focus on that much. Mm. Awesome. Dino, sir, anything else to add or all good if not? But... I, I agree with that. Yeah, I think knowing the content and feeling confident um, enough to be able to enter a practice exam and then it's okay. It's that, like if, if you if a question comes up and you're not sure about the content, then go, go in depth. So that's really the way. That's how I did it too. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I think also doing the practice exams helps you really know if you do or don't know the content. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. All right, cool. We're out of time for questions, but that is it for today. Um, so hopefully you're feeling a bit more confident with the content because we've got through everything, which is awesome. Um, and yeah, we sort of got tip of the iceberg with practice questions. So go look through those VCAR exams. They're all there for you free online. Um, really good resource to look through. Um, so thank you everyone for being here today for your support. And don't forget to sign up for... Um, the next sessions over the next few days. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your week and good luck 